recess at any time during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, as a reminder, please keep your microphone muted unless speaking. Should I hear any of your background noise, I will request a member, please mute your microphone or yell at you. To insert a document into the record, please email it to documentstni at mail.house.gov. Uh, with that, uh, I would uh, yield myself such time as I may consume. Today, um, we're going to hear about the challenges and gaps in protecting our nation's transportation systems and critical infrastructure from cyber attacks and recommendations on how to close uh, those gaps from private industry and cybersecurity experts. Notably, this hearing is largely being conducted online, <laughs> demonstrating how much we all rely on cyber systems to carry out our basic day-to-day -day tasks, particularly uh, in the era of COVID. And even with dedicated and superb IT support, lots of experience, getting everything right 100% of the time is tough. Well, with the house system, it's even not even close to that. But anyway, we won't go into that. But when it comes to the nation's uh, critical infrastructure and transportation networks, pipelines that fuel our economy, water and wastewater treatment plants, Shipping, aviation, railroads, highways that play a critical role in bringing vital supplies to all Americans, getting everything right every time must be the goal. Lives are on the line. And each day when you turn on a faucet, flush your toilet, or when you board a plane, fill up your car with gas, you trust these systems will work. But that trust has been shaken in recent years. We've seen headlines about blows the nation's economy from ransomware attacks by criminal networks on critical infrastructure, and close calls uh, where individual hackers have tried to uh, go after wastewater systems. Uh, by the way, they have, many of them use massive amounts of chlorine. Uh, if they can uh, valve that chlorine into the air, they're gonna kill a lot of people and otherwise, uh, otherwise infiltrate uh, our drinking water systems. The cyber threats and vulnerabilities diverse, expanding, constantly evolving, and have the potential to impact everyone. Yet an estimated 85%, 85% nation's critical infrastructure is in private hands, owned and operated by private entities. And too often leaders whose organizations are at risk from cyber attacks weigh the risk of attack against the cost of increasing cybersecurity protections, and they decide to roll the dice. Hey, it might hurt the stock price uh, if we actually spend a little money on an updated uh, IT system or a better cybersecurity, and hey, that will hurt my annual uh, bonus. So let's uh, let's skate and hope we get away with it. Uh, they're betting they won't get attacked. The good news is even basic steps, like mandating strong passwords, pathetic, and multi-factor authentication, cybersecurity awareness training, and regularly practicing simple cybersecurity exercises, things that cost virtually nothing and our common sense can significantly harden cyber defenses, dramatically diminish a company, utility, or federal agency's chances that they will fall victim to a successful attack. Uh, unfortunately, recent surveys have shown that too many public and private entities don't take these simple steps. Recent survey of the transit sector, 39% of those surveyed have no, none, zero staff dedicated to cybersecurity and more than 24% provide no cybersecurity training uh, to their staff at all. Many of them are using uh, the password on the device when they got it. They don't, you know, just crazy stuff. Uh, this doesn't cost anything. Uh, the water sector is even worse. Survey published in June of this year, 42% of water and wastewater utilities surveyed say they conduct no, no, zero, cybersecurity training for their staff, and more than 68% of them said they do not participate in any cybersecurity-related drills or exercises. Many experts believe uh, we don't have a full and transparent picture of the cybersecurity threats that confront us, impeding our ability to quantify the risks, learn about lessons from past attacks. Reporting cyber breaches, yeah, it can hurt uh, your financial bottom line for a little bit, uh, and, but, um, you know, overall, uh, in the end, you're going to benefit, your stockholders are going to benefit, the American people are going to benefit if you put these protections in place. Um, you know, the FBI has estimated 15% of cyber crimes are actually reported, 15% to the government. 
Recent survey at transit sector, more than 30% of those surveyed said they had been the victim of a cybersecurity incident, but they never reported the incident to anybody. With the public safety and national economic security of the United States at stake, it may be time for voluntary steps by the private sector to give way to mandatory federal reporting requirements. In 2013, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, in consultation with industry, academia, and government, created a cybersecurity risk management framework. Since 2017, the framework has been mandatory for federal agencies, but it hasn't eliminated all the problems, something that we will explore more at a future hearing. In the private sector, however, use of the NIST framework remains voluntary and used unevenly. NIST estimated that in 2020, only 50% of private companies were even trying to reach NIST cybersecurity minimum standards. Uh, the Biden administration has finally begun to change things. In May 2021, the president issued Executive Order 14028 to encourage critical infrastructure companies to, quote, follow the federal government's lead and take ambitious measures to augment and align cybersecurity investments with the goal of minimizing future incidents. In June of this year, DHS's Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency issued guidance that addresses complex networked IT operating technology or OT systems and helps to establish standards for preparing and responding to cyber attacks targeting critical infrastructure. They also issued a national security memorandum that called for creation of cyber performance goals, including establishing baseline cybersecurity performance standards consistent across all critical infrastructure sectors. Uh, just this summer, uh, you know, with the Colonial Pipeline cyber attack, the Transportation uh, Security Administration abandoned voluntary compliance. They had already offered to do a full audit of cybersecurity for Colonial Pipeline. Colonial Pipeline uh, wouldn't have cost them anything. Uh, they didn't want to do that because they didn't want to know what their problems were. Well, it cost them a lot of money and they could have had an evaluation and perhaps closed the door before the ransomware attack. So um, the TSA has abandoned voluntary compliance for pipelines altogether, issuing a directive mandating specific protections to defend against ransomware, along with cybersecurity contingency and recovery plans. TSA is reportedly preparing similar directives for other critical infrastructure sectors, including rail and aviation. So we have an administration that's moving in the right direction. We need to do more. No single technology, policy, or other action will completely eliminate all cyber threats. But every step can help close the gaps and make success for cyber criminals and cyber terrorists harder. I look forward to hearing our witnesses' ideas about how we can do that. Uh, you've been in the uh, trenches of the silent cyber conflict that goes on every day in our critical infrastructure sectors. And you all have ideas on how government, private industry, or both working together can increase our nation's cyber resilience to protect our critical infrastructure and public to recover from cyber attacks uh, when they do and despite our best efforts. So thanks to our witnesses for joining to us. And I will turn now to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Crawford, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As we all know, the cyber threats facing our nation's infrastructure have increased significantly as technology has become more essential and interwoven in our society, both in infrastructure and more broadly in our daily lives. While technology has allowed us to innovate and create efficiencies in infrastructure and transportation networks, it's also brought us new threats and vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, with recent high-profile cyber attacks like those conducted on Colonial Pipeline or various wastewater treatment plants, We've seen a very clear need to better protect our nation's infrastructure through strong cybersecurity defense measures. Fortunately, many transportation and infrastructure operators are already taking action to protect their assets and the passengers and customers that rely on them. While the federal government is working to help the private sector prevent, mitigate, and respond to cyber threats, our cyber adversaries' technology is advancing more quickly than anything the federal government can mandate. In light of this reality, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about their best practices for cyber defense across varying transportation modes. I'd also like to highlight a specific concern regarding the TSA's recent mandatory security directives on cybersecurity for pipelines and forthcoming directives for rail, transit, and aviation. I'm concerned that the TSA's recent security directives are overly prescriptive, rushed, and fail to take into account holistic feedback from diverse stakeholders. 
I'd like to hear stakeholders' input on this issue today, but we must also hear from government witnesses to get the full picture. So I look forward to following up on this topic to ensure that we get uh, every perspective as well. We need to hear how the various agencies are working with operators of our nation's infrastructure as true partners in improving the standards and practices we're using to protect America's infrastructure and transportation networks from growing cyber threats. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we'll uh, now like to uh, welcome the witnesses uh, on our panel. Uh, Scott Belcher, President and Chief Executive Officer, SFB Consulting, LLC, testifying on behalf of Mineta Transportation Institute. Megan Samford, Vice President, Chief Product uh, Security Officer, Energy Management, Schneider Electric, and the International Society of Automation, Global Cybersecurity Alliance. Thomas L. Farmer, Assistant Vice President, Security Association of American Railroads. Michael Stevens, General Counsel and Executive Vice President, Tampa International Airport. John Sullivan, Chief Engineer, Boston Water and Sewer Commission, testifying on behalf of the Water Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And Gary Kessler, a non-resident senior fellow, Atlantic Council. Uh, thanks for uh, joining to us today uh, and uh, giving us some of your time. We look forward to your testimony. Uh, without objection, all of your full statements will be included in the record. And I'd ask you to summarize in five minutes your most succinct uh, and telling points. Uh, with that, uh, I would for now recognize Mr. Belcher for five minutes. There we go. Um, Mr. Belcher. Chairman DeFazio. Oh, there we go. Chairman DeFazio. There we go. Uh, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Crawford, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear for you today and discuss the pressing need to strengthen cybersecurity capabilities of the, US, of the US public transit. Enterprise risk management in the US public transit industry needs a 21st century. Mr. Update. Belcher, could you either perhaps uh, speak up a little, turn up your volume, or maybe we can do it on our end just a little bit, It'd be great. Okay, let me, uh, enterprise risk management in the US public transit industry needs a 21st century upgrade whereby specific attention is paid to strengthening cyber protection and preparedness across the industry. Is that better? Can you hear me better now? Yes, thank you. Okay. It's critical that transit, that the tra that transit industries better understand how their risk profile is changing and the, risk and the threat landscape is evolving. Even the smallest and most conventional public transit agencies today rely on multiple digital technologies that has exposed them to cyber threats, whether it's through digital enabled hardware or systems that are managed in their, in their, yard, in their yards. Last year, my colleagues and I released a report from the Mineta Transportation Institute entitled, Is the Transit Industry Prepared for the Cyber Rev Revolution? Um, policy recommendations to enhance surface transit cyber preparedness. Our bottom line takeaway was that most transit operators have a lot of work to do to elevate their understanding of and preparedness for cyber related risk, risks to their operations, their data, and their business infrastructure. Our report concludes that for many transit agencies, internal resources for cybersecurity are scarce. And even among those agencies that have resources, and that are aware um, acquiring these resources are a long and laborious activity. In our view, there needs to be a collaborative effort between the federal government, the industry and agency leadership to establish, maintain, refine and support cybersecurity programs. Most, transits, most transit agencies are unprepared to prevent or respond to the broad array of threat vectors ranging from phishing and business mail compromise to data breaches and ransomware attacks. In fact, a key finding from our report is that many agencies do not have an accurate sense of their cybersecurity preparedness. On the one hand, 81% of the responding agencies believe that they're prepared to manage and defend against cybersecurity threats. In fact, 73% of those respondents felt that they had adequate information 
to help implement their cybersecurity pre preparedness programs. Even so, only 60% of the respondents have a cybersecurity program in place. 43% of the respondents do not believe they have the resources necessary for cybersecurity preparedness. And only 47% 47, 47 of the respondents audit their cybersecurity pro, uh, programs on an annual basis. That's simply unacceptable. Despite the industry differences, cybersecurity maturity models exist and assessment practices that are used across other industries can be, are transferable and can be transferred and utilized in the transit industry. The transit industry is experiencing an increasing number of high profile attacks. We have seen the Metropolitan Transit Authority in New York City. We've seen Martha's Vineyard Ferry in Massachusetts. We've seen the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transfer Transportation Authority or SEPTA in Philadelphia be uh, hacked in the last year. And in fact, just last week, we saw um, the, trans the Toronto Transit Commission be, be attacked by a, a malware attack um, and that had significant it had a significant impact. And in fact, between June um, of 2020 and June of 2021, there's been a 186% increase in weekly ransomware attacks in the transportation industry. Our risk management priorities identified that transit executives, or tra identified by transit executives, identify that business continuity, data protection are the two areas most immediately at risk to cyber, by cyber threats. So with that, um, thank you for the opportunity for your continued lead, or thank you for the opportunity and for your continued leadership in the space. My written testimony has been submitted for the record and I look forward to responding to your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Belcher. Uh, Ms. Sanford. Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Crawford, and members of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, on behalf of the International Society of Automation Global Cybersecurity Alliance, the ISAGCA, and its over 50 public and private sector automation and cybersecurity member organizations that cross all 16 critical infrastructure sectors and comprise over 1.5 trillion in aggregate revenue, Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Incident Command System for Industrial Control Systems, ICS for ICS. My name is Megan Sanford. As the Advisory Board Chair of the ISA GCA, I am representing the member organizations that are all aligned around the ISA IEC 62443 standard for cybersecurity and that are strongly committed to securing the industrial control systems that are at the heart and lungs of American critical infrastructures. I am also the Vice President of Product Cybersecurity and Chief Product Security Officer for Schneider Electric's energy management business. Schneider Electric was a founding member of the ISA GCA and is committed to ensuring the efficiency, resiliency, sustainability, and cybersecurity of electric, of electric grids globally. Lastly, I am co-chair of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Control Systems Working Group. My background in emergency management dates back to 2007 when I graduated from Virginia Commonwealth University as one of the first 50 individuals in the United States with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness. From there, I worked under Governors Tim Kaine and Bob McDonnell, lastly serving as Virginia's Critical Infrastructure Protection Coordinator. Most recently, and what I am happy to testify on today, I became one of four cybersecurity first responders to be formally credentialed as a type one cyber incident commander under the FEMA National Incident Management System Incident Command System. The private sector lacks a consistent, repeatable and scalable framework to respond to day-to-day -day cyber incidents as well as cyber incidents where the impact spans suppliers, customers and coordination with local state and federal government. This is due to a lack of interoperability of individual company response plans. In the event of a large scale cyber incident, this deficiency can lead to poorly executed responses that have impacts on lives and property. The goal of ICS for ICS is to identify how the private sector 
can adopt portions of the FEMA incident command system to ensure coordinated, uniform, and more effective cyber incident response. Implementing ICS for ICS at scale will help the United States more effectively coordinate response and recovery efforts, especially for critical infrastructures. Together with members from DHS and the national labs, the ISAGCA and its member organizations such as Schneider Electric, Honeywell, Johnson Controls, and Mandiant have established a fully volunteer public-private partnership to deliver the ICS for ICS framework. The success of the program thus far indicates that it provides value for both the private sector as well as government. In a little over a year from its standup, the program has proven that it is possible to apply the NIMS Incident Command System framework to cyber incident responses in the private sector, credential and type cyber incident response roles into a common response structure, similar to fire and emergency services, as well as create draft common response templates to speed up responses and reduce error. This is especially critical when responding to events like ransomware attacks, as was the case with Colonial Pipeline. Poorly managed cyber incident responses can be devastating to our national security, safety, and economy. Even after 20 years, many of the same response challenges that faced emergency responders on 9-11 continue to be challenges for us now, except in cyber incident response, lack of common response frameworks and interoperability. With so much at stake, we must effectively manage cyber incidents together with both the private sector and government. The incident command system allows us to do so. The effort is ramping up quickly and deserves a home in the United States government. On behalf of the ICS for ICS effort, I respectfully request your bipartisan support for this important program in requesting that the government investigate ways to expand the spirit of language captured in Homeland Security Presidential Directive 5, which directed public sector adoption of incident command system to now encourage adoption within the private sector. Additionally, we respectfully request that Congress make the necessary plans and investments for the private sector to become trained and credentialed in incident command system. And lastly, the ICS for ICS be operationalized as an official government program residing in the US Department of Homeland Security or another entity if appropriate. Thank you so much for your time today and your consideration. I look forward to answering any questions you all may have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sanford. Uh, Mr. Farmer. Thank you, sir. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Crawford, members of the committee, thank you all for the opportunity to address such an important subject on behalf of America's railroads. Across the industry, railroads and the organizations that support them take their role as critical infrastructure underpinning the U.S. economy very seriously. In all efforts, the commitment to safety is paramount. This commitment applies with equal strength to our comprehensive and collaborative effort in cybersecurity. The key point we hope you take away today is this. Railroads have a proven and longstanding commitment to collaboration within our industry, across sectors, and with government to protect against cyber attacks. The underlying premise is that prevention is attainable with the right structures, supporting the right people, armed with timely and actionable cyber threat intelligence and security information, we can prevent attacks and mitigate their effects should they occur. The right people, the experienced cybersecurity professionals of railroads, deeply familiar with their networks and operations, who bring expertise and judgment to bear in planning, protective measures, and collaborative efforts. They ensure those fundamental measures outlined by the chairman earlier are taken consistently and effectively. Serving as a focal point for the industry's unified efforts of Rail Information Security Committee, the right structure formed by major freight railroads and Amtrak more than two decades ago, comprised of chief information security officers and cybersecurity leads for railroads and industry organizations, the committee focuses continuously on addressing cyber threats, incidents, and significant security concerns. What are we seeing? Sharing effective practices and protective measures, what we're doing about it. Coordinated cyber incident response planning, how we work together effectively. Benchmarking cybersecurity posture against the NIST cybersecurity framework continuous attention to how we can get better. Working with key industry suppliers in a dedicated joint coordination information sharing group, how we strive to detect and act upon vulnerabilities and concerns before they can be exploited. 
and engaging proactively with government departments and agencies in the United States and Canada. How we support informed vigilance and effective action across sectors. The industry as a whole benefits from this assembled expertise and shared experience, accomplishments and priorities in network protection for safety and operational resilience. In support of this vital work, a top priority for our industry is maximizing effectiveness through information sharing. Reports by railroads and industry organizations is a linchpin for this effort. These reports are made to the Railway Alert Network, which works with the reporting railroad to produce a cybersecurity advisory on the activity of concern, describing how it manifested, what the indicators are, and what measures should be taken to narrow risk profile. Through this network, we disseminate these advisories widely among freight and passenger railroads in the United States and Canada, and to hundreds of recipients and federal government organizations, including CISA, TSA, the FBI, DOT, Department of Defense Commands, and Transport Canada. Further, meeting a commitment we made at the inaugural Transportation Sector Cybersecurity Tabletop Exercise held by TSA in August 2015, we share the advisories as representatives of each of the transportation modes and the other critical infrastructure sectors. We have done so consistently for more than six years now. Unfortunately, what we've not seen is consistency in analyses of the reports we have submitted to government organizations. And we believe these efforts can and should be enhanced and are committed to working with government for this purpose. The overall aim remains consistent, get the right information through the right structures to the right people to make a difference. Government action should foster these proven collaborative efforts in order to expand them and enhance them, not override or disrupt them. The president specifically urged this cal caliber of collaborative effort in his national security memorandum on improving cybersecurity issued in late July of this year. The railroad industry supports the president's approach and desired outcomes. We sought to attain them in a third proposal submitted to TSA in mid-August on enhancing cybersecurity posture across the transportation sector. However, in early October, the Secretary of Homeland Security announced that TSA will issue security directives to mandate cybersecurity actions by railroads and rail transit agencies. These mandates are not only unnecessary, but also could prove counterproductive, disrupting well-established and proven practices. Railroads are meeting the main mandates the plan directives will impose, but the prescriptive elements for each race series concerned that what we've done so well and for so long in partnership with government will be undermined. We must avoid a command and control approach and instead build upon an impressive track record of collaboration. My written statement of the committee outlines considerations for legislative action on cybersecurity, on which I am happy to address questions this morning. But two points merit emphasis here. First, Congress has already acted effectively through the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015. This statute is vastly underutilized by security agencies and government. It should not be. For it expressly authorizes sharing of cyber threat intelligence and related security information within industries, across sectors, and between industry and government. It also provides essential protections that build and alleviate impediments to the flow of timely and actionable information. Had this statute been effectively implemented, there would not be even a perceived need for new legislation or security directives on cyber incident reporting. And second, the gap in analyses of reporting of significant cybersecurity concerns by, should be resolved, closed, by expanding the analytical capabilities of CISA's workforce before any more mandates requiring more reporting are made. CISA Director Jenny Sley testified earlier this week, emphasizing her view that her agency's most effective role is in support and collaboration for sustained enhancements across sectors of cybersecurity posture. Legislation should enable accomplishment of this admirable purpose. In closing, we are proud that we have been proactive, effective, and collaborative for so long in this challenging arena. Policymakers here and executive agencies play an important role alongside private enterprise, remaining nimble and effective without concerns for liability or enforcement action and financial penalties for business is vital. As Congress considers new measures, please look to build upon the collaborative approach that has largely succeeded to date. Thank you, and I'm very happy to address any questions you may have this morning. Okay, thank you, Mr. Farmer. Uh, Mr. Stevens. Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Crawford, and distinguished members of the committee, good morning. My name is Michael Stevens. I'm the General Counsel and Executive Vice President for Information Technology at Tampa International Airport. We thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing and to offer the aviation perspective. More than 2.9 million passengers travel through America's airports each and every day. The five largest US airports, U.S. airports alone have more passengers flowing through them than the entire population of the United States. U.S. commercial airports are connected, critical infrastructure ecosystems that are essential, not only to our nation's economic prosperity, but to our national security. The aviation industry accounts for more than 5.2% of our national GDP and supports nearly 11 million jobs. The aviation sector, like other sectors represented here today, faces significant challenges from persistent and increasingly pernicious cyber threats. In short, digital code, computers, and keyboards have become the newest tools of criminals and the preferred weapons of war for nation states and other U.S. adversaries. It is my opinion that cybersecurity threats, without question, 
represent the most persistent danger to the safe, secure, and efficient operations of U.S. airports in the global aviation system. And while there is no silver bullet or perfect defense against cybersecurity threats, there are numerous critical activities that can be undertaken by key stakeholders to increase our overall cybersecurity preparedness and resilience. For the purpose of this hearing, I have distilled my remarks down to four key areas. First, the mandatory adoption of minimum cyber standards. Although aviation and airports and other sector stakeholders have engaged in building and achieving various levels of cyber maturity, there are currently no significant requirements for adherence to minimum baseline standards or preparedness frameworks. Given the growing threat environment, the aviation sector has approached an inflection point where voluntary cyber compliance is simply no longer adequate. I believe significant consideration should be given by aviation sector regulatory agencies to mandating the adoption and periodic testing of established cybersecurity standards and resiliency frameworks. Second, the timely and effective sharing of information and threat intelligence is essential to assessing and mitigating cyber vulnerabilities. Consideration should be given to mandatory disclosure of critical and actionable cyber incidents that meet an agreed upon threat threshold, irrespective of whether or not the incident resulted in an actual data breach or system compromise. Third, we must close the human factors gap. Notwithstanding the most effective standards, technological defenses, and threat sharing efforts, the human factor remains the most highly exploited vector for penetrating cyber defenses. The aviation sector has taken cybersecurity seriously and continues to implement processes to enhance cyber awareness and security. However, the depth and the quality of training can vary significantly depending upon the entity. Requiring the adoption of baseline standards, which establish minimum training requirements for critical aviation sector employees should be given significant consider consideration. And finally, we must dramatically increase our national focus on workforce development in order to build our cyber defense capacity. In short, we are losing the race for talent. In the US, we have a critical shortage of cybersecurity talent with essential skills such as security and network engineers and software developers. These types of skills are absolutely necessary in order to increase our cyber resilience capabilities. The scarcity of these types of skills represents a significant risk to US competitiveness and security. As the use of current and future technologies increases to support airports, airlines, and other critical aviation systems, the threat of disruptive cyber attacks will undoubtedly increase as well. The need for additional federal assist assistance, information sharing, workforce training, and the adoption of baseline standards are all essential to our national security and long-term economic prosperity. Mm -hmm. Again, we thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you uh, for your testimony, uh, and Mr. Stevens, and now we'd move to uh, John Sullivan. Ms. Sullivan, recognize Chairman, five minutes. Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Crawford, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on cybersecurity challenges facing the nation's water and wastewater infrastructure. I am John Sullivan, Chief Engineer of the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. I am also Chair of the Water Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or Water ISAC, and deliver my testimony today in that capacity. Water ISAC is a nonprofit organization established in 2002 by the National Water and Wastewater Associations at the urging of EPA and the FBI to provide utilities with critical information on physical and cybersecurity threats and best practices for prevention and response. <clears throat> Water ISAC member utilities currently serve 206 million people across the United States, about 60% of the US population. While EPA and Congress provided some funding to get the service up and running in the early 2000s, today, member dues payments support 100% of the Water ISAC's budget. We know that water and wastewater utilities pose attractive targets for cyber attackers. <clears throat> My written testimony references several region recent cyber intrusions against water and wastewater systems that occurred last year, targeting utilities across the country. Perhaps best known is the attack earlier this year against a water utility serving Oldsmar, Florida. <clears throat> While utility staff immediately observed the breach, 
and took corrective action, <clears throat> excuse me, that prevented any impacts to water quality or public health, it's easy to imagine how the outcome could have been much worse. For example, <clears throat> consider an attack that infiltrates the industrial control systems of a wastewater system and disables the treatment train or the pumps <clears throat> that move sewage from one part to another. This could result in the release of large amounts of sewage into rivers and streams, harming the natural ecology of the receiving waters, creating a public health nuisance, and potentially contaminating sources of drinking water. The Boston Water and Sewer had its own experience with a cybersecurity incident last year in the form of a ransomware attack. While it complicated day-to-day -day business and was costly to recover from, there was never any threat to public or environmental health due to precautions such as our business network being segregated from our control systems. This is a best practice in any sector that uses industrial control systems, but this approach is not consistent across the nation's 16,000 wastewater systems and 50,000 drinking water systems. With such a large universe of water systems across the country, many are bound to have a lack of understanding of these cyber best practices or a lack of expertise and equipment to implement them. This is where the Water Rice Act can help. In Boston's case, the center was instrumental in our recovery from our incident as it referred us to a firm specializing in ransomware incident response, which helped us navigate our way through the event. More broadly, Water Rice Act offers resources such as 15 security fundamentals for water and wastewater utilities, a set of best practices for the protection of information technology and industrial control systems. The 15 fundamentals provide straightforward, but sometimes overlooked tasks like enforcing user access controls, performing asset inventories, addressing vulnerability management, and creating a cybersecurity culture. As the committee conducts oversight of cybersecurity at wastewater utilities and other critical infrastructure entities, we recommend an approach that provides more resources to both wastewater systems themselves and to the EPA in its capacity as a sector risk management agency for the water and wastewater sector. These resources could come in the form of technical assistance programs to help medium and small wastewater systems implement technology upgrades and secure external services initiatives to expand the reach of the Water Rights Act to all wastewater systems nationwide, assessment assistance and training to help wastewater systems comply with best practices. One promising approach can be found in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. One provision in this bill would encourage electric utilities to bolster their cyber preparations and would seek to increase participation in the Electricity Information Sharing and Analysis Center, Water ISAC's counterpart for the electric sector. A similar direction for EPA to take steps to bolster the water sector participation in the Water Rights Act, especially among the wastewater systems serving fewer than 100,000 people, would help get threat information and best practices into more hands across the country. We would be happy to work with you on this uh, effort. Thank you for the chance to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Uh, and our last witness uh, will be uh, Gary Kessler. Mr. Kessler, five minutes. Thank you. Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Crawford, and members and staff of the committee, thank you for the invitation and opportunity to speak today. I'm Gary Kessler, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and one of the co-authors of the Council's report, Raising the Colors, Signaling for Cooperation on Maritime Cybersecurity. I've spent my professional career since the 1970s in the information technology and information security field. I'm a retired professor of cybersecurity, co-author of a book on maritime cybersecurity, and a principal consultant at Fathom 5 working on cyber issues related to maritime operational technology testbeds. I also hold a national office in the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Cybersecurity Division, and I'm a visiting faculty member at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Most people in the United States do not think of our country as a maritime nation. They don't understand and appreciate our nation's reliance upon the Maritime Transportation System, or MTS, for our very way of life. Our report addresses that dependence in some very tangible ways, from the $5.4 trillion contribution to the U.S. economy, representing about 25% of our country's gross domestic product, to the 30 million jobs. Roughly 80% of global trade and nearly two-thirds of the world's total petroleum and other liquid energy supply is carried by ship. In the United States, approximately 90% of our imports exports move by sea, emphasizing the fact that most global supply chains are existentially dependent upon maritime. 
Consider the disruption to the global supply chain caused earlier this year when Evergiven became stuck in the Suez Canal, costing the global trading community nearly $9 billion each day. Much closer to home, note the current disruption to US supply chains because of the backlog of the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, the entry for nearly 40% of US imports. The ability to move military personnel and material by sea combined with the global presence of US Navy warships and the US Coast Guard are fundamental to US military power projection around the world. The maritime transportation system is critical and poses significant challenges to policymakers. The MTS is composed of many independent yet codependent and inextricably intertwined systems representing ships, ports, shipping lines, inland waterways and intermodal transfers. The system of systems metaphor speaks to the fact that the maritime sector is not monolithic where a single set of rules or regulations can manage the industry. This provides a particular challenge to legislators, regulators, and those with administrative responsibility alike. Like the rest of the industrial world, MTS stakeholders take advantage of new technology, and this goes to the very heart of why we are here today. The modern computer age dates back only about 75 years. Commercialization of the internet began a mere 30 years ago. The acceleration of change in computing and communication technologies is now almost beyond comprehension and includes advances in processors, sensors, embedded computers, operational technology, cyber physical systems, navigation, big data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. These advances have led to the internet of things, smart ships and ports, the ocean of things, automation in maritime systems, and fully autonomous vessels. Computer attacks that were almost unheard of 30 years ago are commonplace today. Ships that barely had a computer on board 25 years ago are now susceptible to cyber attack even in the middle of the ocean. Multiple sources report a sharp uptick in the number of cyber attacks directed toward the MTS since 2019, including more than a dozen ransomware events in the last 18 months. Cybersecurity has risen to become a significant threat to the maritime sector. No less than the food security, energy security, economic security, homeland security, and national security of the United States are dependent upon the seas. The maritime transportation sector is broad, diverse, and global, so that while international cooperation is essential, central management is impossible. Cyber vulnerabilities are as plentiful in the maritime sector as in the non-maritime world and provide unique threats to the industry. The National Maritime Security Plan was a clarion call about a significant threat facing this country. Our report, Raising the Colors, was a first step at trying to provide a tactical approach to addressing that threat. We have to continue pushing forward to address this critical issue. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions and further discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I begin uh, with the uh, questions uh, to the panel. Uh, you know, a major point of uh, contention is, I, I guess there are two, it's two issues. One is uh, reporting. Um, and for instance, uh, Mr. Belcher, uh, you talked about 30% of transit systems you surveyed had been the victim of cybersecurity, but they never reported the incident. Um, and then, uh, you know, so that, that's one issue, is reporting, whether or not reporting should be mandatory. And what's the value of people reporting? Uh, I would assume that, you know, there are many things to be learned when someone reports and uh, we properly analyze uh, and they report what the attack was. It may well benefit others uh, in their same sector of industry, whichever one of these sectors we're talking about. And secondly, is the idea of whether or not there should be a mandate. Now, I, I understand concerns about a very prescriptive uh, mandate, but a mandate that um, you know all critical sector organizations have, you know, some sort of cybersecurity uh, officer or at least designee if they have very few employees among uh, their staff. Uh, and uh, that they are sort of bird-dogging the people within their organization. So I, I guess I'd like briefly, if we could, each member of the panel to uh, 
you know, just quickly opine on the value of mandatory reporting and uh, a requirement uh, that doesn't have to be totally prescriptive, but you have to have uh, someone designated uh, for cybersecurity uh, within your organization if you're involved in critical infrastructure. So any member of the panel who wishes to respond uh, briefly would be, uh, I'd be appreciated. Well, I'm Jimmy. happy to start. Um, uh, so I think I, I would agree, I, I, I'm very comfortable with mandatory reporting and um, and very comfortable with a designated um, cybersecurity official. Um, and that and I recognize that um, I mean, I work with a lot of a, a large number of very small and mid-sized transit organizations that do not have cybersecurity professionals. Um, in fact, they're lucky to have uh, IT professionals. Um, nevertheless, um, you know this is an important issue that that is part of the that is part of something that they have to do. It's part of an enterprise uh, management issue, and I think um, one of the things that we have to do as we look at man managing organizations is to great is to make cybersecurity just part of the enterprise management, um, the management of risk, and the management of um, of, of security of the organization. And so identifying somebody, whether it's a, an employee or an, a, a consultant that is there and can, and that can engage with TSA, um, on a 24 hour basis, I think is absolutely essential. Okay. Um, I think Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Belcher. Anyone uh, from any of the other sectors, uh, wish to respond? Chairman, this is uh, Michael Stevens from Tampa International. I would uh, echo that sentiment. I, while I don't think that there is a problem with mandates, we are not unfamiliar with mandates for reporting in the aviation sector. For example, if you have an airfield incursion that's not authorized, we have to report that. If you have a sterile airside incursion, we have to report that. Uh, so there's not a problem with reporting and mandates for reporting. The problem becomes though, what are we reporting? Part of the TSA proposed guidance that uh, we have been providing comments to is very, very broad based in terms of what is being required to be reported. And information just for the sake of information is not necessarily a good thing because it leads to information overload and white noise and a lot of times gets uh, ignored. So I think uh, while reporting mandates are appropriate, we have to tailor those to make sure that they're actionable. As I said in my opening comment, and then secondly, I do believe uh, that if we have uh, mandatory minimum standards, uh, baseline standards for cyber resilience, a lot of those types of things uh, that are falling through the cracks, reporting, uh, identification, mitigation strategies will start to uh, be resolved. So I think that both of those things are things that we need to do, but we need to do them in the right way. Thank you. It's a very valuable comment on uh, too much reporting of, of things that would not be of value. Uh, and sure. just, uh, Mr. Chairman, may, may I may I yeah. add to that, please? Sure, quickly. Yeah. Thank you, sir. It, the, the key challenge here with the reporting mandate, is, as has been presented to us by TSA, is just what Mr. Stevens highlighted. Uh, and CISA Executive Director Jen Easterly, she's made a point to emphasize that her agency is interested in signals, not noise. And that's what we've been providing in the rail sector for several years, dating back at least to the 2014, 2015 timeframe. We're providing them with information products that delineate what happened, what a railroad observed, what the indicators were, and what they did about it in terms of a security response with recommendations that we share widely on measures that other railroads can take. And additionally, as I indicated in the opening statement, we provide thoroughly to our partners in other transportation modes and sectors and to government. And on the appointment of the coordinator, again, we don't object to that. We've had cybersecurity coordinators for an extended period of time, but the draft TSA directive has a, a significant limitation. It requires US citizenship. And the challenge there is we have two major operations, uh, railroads that operate from Canada to the United States, CN and Canadian Pacific. And they're going to have exceedingly difficult time meeting that standard because their network operations, their expertise is in Canada. And the what's really disconcerting here is we've put a lot of effort in with TSA in working collaboratively to overcome objections 
to a sharing of classified information with those cleared staff in Canada with clearances from Canadian government. And so we just don't understand the basis for that restriction because really setting up two major freight railroads for failure in meeting the future directive. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That was, uh, that was very helpful. My time has expired and now I recognize uh, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this month it was reported that TSA will soon issue mandatory security directives for rail transit and potentially aviation. Uh, uh, Mr. Farmer, how much stakeholder engagement has TSA conducted in advance of their release? So there's been two outreaches in TSA where we've been provided drafts of the directives but to provide comments. In each case, they were done on a 72-hour response timeline. Is that typical for TSA? When the decision is taken to issue a security directive, the timelines are narrow. Uh, we believe that there is a clear opportunity here, consistent with the President's National Security Memorandum, to collaborate on the content of the directives so that the disruptive effects that we see uh, can be alleviated and avoided. The previous mandatory directives for pipelines followed the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack. If you recall, what incident or security threats are uh, ne necessitating a mandatory security directive for freight rail or transit? Sir, we have not been apprised of any imminent or elevated threat to railroads or rail transit agencies as a justification for this emergency action. And nor are our railroads seeing the sort of activity that would be indicative of an elevated, specific, persistent threat to rail. And if you were apprised fairness, of, of such a threat, how would that be communicated to you? We have well-established procedures with TSA for sharing information. Uh, we have quarterly teleconferences with their surface division. There's a group called the Surface Transportation Security Advisory Committee that meets quarterly. Uh, we have our Industry Cybersecurity Committee. Uh, the Rail Information Security Committee convenes twice a month. So there are ample opportunities to communicate with us at an unclassified level. But we've taken it a step further. We've worked with the agency to establish a secure video teleconference network so that they can deliver classified presentations up to the secret level nationally mm -hmm. so that railroad cyber leads can participate from locations in their headquarters areas. So there is a robust exchange protocol already in place? Yes, sir. We have devoted extensive efforts to creating a range of options to communicate information, both unclassified and classified up to the secret level. So you're confident that if there were some threats uh, to rail, you would be warned in a, in a timely manner, you'd be aware of it and that those uh, communications channels are, uh, are open and available? Yes, sir. And, and, but you don't see any threat or have not been apprised of any threat that to your mind would warrant um, the mandatory security directive that's being proposed by TSA right now? Yes, sir, we, we've not been apprised of the threat that's the justification for this emergency action through any of those communication channels I've referenced. I'm based in Washington, DC. My colleague at the American Public Transportation Association is as well. Uh, we can be read in at the top secret level. Uh, that initiative has not been taken. In fairness to TSA, they have referenced that there is a briefing being developed and that it will be given. It's not yet been scheduled, mm -hmm. uh, but our concern is we have cybersecurity leads who, as part of our industry protocol, our emphasis on cybersecurity, every quarter, the boards of directors meetings, cybersecurity is a recurring subject. Mm. And they're being asked questions about these directives, what the driving impetus is, and they can't answer them because we've not been provided that detail. Let me ask you uh, how you think the, the security directive might interact with what you already have in place, your current rail cybersecurity measures or reporting systems. On the reporting systems, sir, the, the, the key challenge is the breadth of the definition of cybersecurity incident is such that it's going to overwhelm uh, what Director Easterly at CISA wants to accomplish, and that's to get signals that are indications of potential cybersecurity concerns, significant cybersecurity concerns, as opposed so to a lot of noise. And you're afraid that this might just basically uh, create more noise and it might be more difficult to catch those signals. Yes, sir. And I think the challenge is, and it's twofold, it, it's the, the breadth of the reporting uh, protocol, uh, cybersecurity incident is widely defined. Secondly, the timeline. Uh, it, initially, it was 12 hours based on input we provide has been extended to 24. I think many cybersecurity experts would tell you that it's very difficult 
in that first 24 hour period to have insight into whether what's taking place is actually significant from a cybersecurity perspective. Mm -hmm. Let me We've got the right experts in place yeah. and they can provide the right information. Just real quick in the time I have remaining, can you give us some uh, uh, ideas of what some of the cybersecurity practices that you have already adopted and implemented in frail, re uh, frail rate recently? Yes, sir. That, and the efforts in this area go back uh, more than two decades. That's how long we've had a cybersecurity focus committee and it is a continuous analysis process of what the prevailing threats are and what we can be doing effectively to address them. The committee provides a, a collaborative approach. We share information on cybersecurity concerns. We share information on effective practices. Uh, the chairman in his opening remarks outlined a series of actions, multi-factor authentication, uh, the conduct of assessments, action on those assessments, uh, strong passwords. Those fundamental, measure, those fundamental measures are being taken. I think most importantly, no one's resting on laurels. We take the NIST cybersecurity framework and we assess our cybersecurity posture against that framework at least every two years. And based on the lessons learned, we focus on enhancing our practices. And all the effort we're devoting to information sharing is designed to make sure the right people have what they need and can take the right measures uh, to narrow their risk profile and prevent harm from happening. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. My time's expired. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, <laughs> this this uh, cybersecurity presents a fairly unique challenge to members of Congress. We're supposed to do something <laughs> about problems, recognizing, however, that there's no cure all uh, for cybersecurity. Uh, but, Mr. Belcher, you discussed the need for carrots and sticks to ensure the necessary resources uh, are utilized by transit uh, and uh, their agencies. You also mentioned the need for the Fe Federal Transit Administration to require organizations to adopt and implement minimum cybersecurity standards prior to receiving federal funding. I would like you to briefly explain the specific carrots and sticks you would recommend the federal government use to get transit organizations uh, to the minimum cybersecurity standards you see as urgently needed. Mr. Belcher. Sure, um, I'd be happy to. Um, so I think that there's a, so uh, Mr. Farmer, um, described a situation in the rail industry that's a little bit different from the industry, the situation in the transit industry. The transit industry has, um, has over 3,000 uh, transit operators, public transit operators that range in size and sophistication. Um, and my experience with them is that they are uh, desperate for regulation and they're desperate to be told what to do. This is, this is really an area where they don't know what to do. Um, and in fact, just um, yesterday I, I was brief, I, I was speaking and I had a transit CEO ask me what they needed to do to secure their Zoom calls. So that was the level of sophistication that they have when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, and this was a CEO. Um, so they get the same briefings um, that Mr. Farmer talked about, um, but they don't have the resources to do it. So, um, so you have a couple of things. You, you have um, a series of agencies that are under-resourced and that are, um, have, to, um, have, have to manage, um, you know, and, and then through the pandemic have, have found their resources have been stretched further. And so they have a whole new series of um, challenges facing them. So, I mean, the, the, the carrots are to provide um, funds to support them and to provide them with tools to support them. And those tools are um, contract contractual language. They're, the tools are to provide them with cybersecurity assessments, the large, um, transit operators do get resources, do get federal funding 
do get support from TSA to do assessments, do, to do audits, to do cybersecurity plans, but the vast unwashed do not. The, one, the small, mid-sized transit agencies do not get funds for that, do not get that level of support. Um, so those are the ones who really need it desperately. Um, they need that help. And, and as it relates to, the, um, to what you can do with respect to the agencies, I think you need to have the, um, before, a federal, before a transit agency receives federal money from the FTA, they need to certify that they have a cybersecurity plan in place. Because we found that almost 50% of the um, of the agencies do not have a basic cybersecurity plan in place. Yeah. Well, that, 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 that's really helpful. Mr. Belcher, um, I'm really interested in this issue. Um, uh, you spoke about uh, cyber, cyber attacks that already have involved transit agencies in cities like New York, places like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Vancouver. Now, I represent the District of Columbia. Many, <laughs> uh, many members of Congress and their staff use transit agencies here, so these cyber effects could have very specific and harmful effect on, on Congress itself. Um, can you discuss how the tax have impacted average citizens? Uh, sure. for, uh, you know, for example, uh, have these uh, disrupt, disrupt, disruptions and the huge increase, 186 increase in ransomware attacks on transportation sector generally uh, shown us the attack uh, on the average person using transportation? Yes, in a number of ways. Um, one example is in, at SEPTA, which had a major attack, a major ransomware attack um, last year or earlier um, earlier this year. Uh, SEPTA was forced to shut down its um, public communication system, so it was not able to communicate with its customers for almost two months digitally. So most, um, or not most, but a large percentage of its um, customers utilize mobile applications to determine when their bus or the train was going to arrive and how to access it. And they pay for it with a mobile application. They couldn't do that any longer. Many, many customers go and look on a mobile a digital screen to see when their bus is going to arrive. They couldn't do that any longer. They had to go back to paper schedules. Um, and so um, they were forced to do that. So that, that's one example. A second example is that when um, a transit agency has to pay out a ransom, which many of them do, um, first of all, they may be insured once. Once they pay out a ransom, um, where the likelihood that they're going to get insurance a second time is highly unlikely. So that's, that's going to increase the cost of operations. Um, so there, there are a variety of ways that, um, that, uh, that people are impacted. Um, and, and then third, it can, it can impact the operations. I mean, the, the, main, the main things you're, we're, we're concerned about right now are not the things that you would think about in terms of like, like the movie Speed. That's what we all think about is somebody's going to take over and, and take over a bus or take over a train uh, autonomously. That, that's not what CEOs stay up at night. They, they sit, they, they're worried about somebody taking over PII, uh, the customer's uh, or the employee's uh, personal information or the operating system. And those are the things that, those are the things that hackers are getting a hold of and, and impacting up and, and that impact um, passengers. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Belcher. Um, I, I, Next call on Mr. Gibbs. I, th thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Kessler, uh, I'm gonna ask questions here about the maritime industry. Uh, is it inherently more difficult in protecting IT communication systems that are both worldwide and requires ship to shore communications? Um, are, are, you, are you asking if it's harder to uh, secure those? Well, I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to understand 
complications of when you get, when you've got a shipping company that's worldwide that has ship to shore communications, do they establish firewalls, you know, land based uh, ships and, you know, just how does all that relate and how vulnerable are they to cyber attacks, I guess? Well, th there is, there is vulnerable as any other remote communications. Um, one of the mechanisms that are used widely to talk to ships is by, uh, by VSAT, very small aperture terminals. And um, there have been any number of studies and demonstrations, particularly at the hacker conferences, about the fact that um, when the communication is coming back down, it is not directed at a ship or even a place on Earth that's going to a total footprint um, on Earth. And that makes it very easy for people to intercept those communications, which are, uh, in, in a large way, um, unencrypted. And so again, the demonstrations at the hacker conferences have shown all sorts of very interesting communications um, coming between ships and back to shipping headquarters or just um, in internet access for you know, passengers that are just sending emails that are also invariably unencrypted. Um, so, so that's one of, one of the unique communications problems we have on ships. Um, certainly the ships themselves are using firewalls. Um, what I believe we're going to see ongoing as we get more and more autonomous vessels and remote controlled vessels um, is the fact that if I'm able to remotely access a vessel in order to provide control, it's naive to believe that nobody else could somehow also take over that communication. Furthermore, when I get fully autonomous vessels, that means we're going to have to change the collision regulations or the maritime rules of the road. Um, for example, you're required to have a lookout on board a vessel. Well, if I have a fully autonomous vessel, I can't have a lookout. So instead, what I'm gonna do is have a whole bunch of cameras. Yep. and they're going to be remotely monitored, that will suffice for my lookout. Well, again, if I can remotely access the cameras, then it would be naive to believe that nobody else could break in and look at the cameras, possibly change the contrast setting on a camera so that the camera is now blind. Okay. So let those me, are some of the issues. Let me, yeah, let me just interrupt you because I'm running out of time. Uh, on the time, that, that's I, you know, more in the future a little bit. But I also was concerned... We had the malware attack on Maersk in 2017. Uh, can you tell us what specific steps maybe have been taken by the shipping industry to mitigate future attacks? And have we been more vulnerable with the crisis, the crisis of the supply chain with all the ships being idled and, and uh, backlog? Well, very quickly, um, Maersk, of course, was whacked quite hard by a ransomware attack for which they were not a target. Um, they were merely susceptible. Um, and I believe that that was, though, a wake-up alarm for the maritime industry. However, as I said in, in my testimony, there were at least a dozen well-known attacks um, in 2020 and 2021 that were directed at the maritime industry. There have been at least two maritime um, entities that have been hit by two ransomware campaigns during that period of time. So while the awareness has gone up, and there has been positive responses, it seems that it continues to be an ongoing problem. So we, we, so we haven't really got, uh, found really any uh, satisfactory solutions to, to address it. So, so kind of really vulnerable. Is that what, I, I, think the, I think the satisfactory solutions have not been implemented. And some of those things have been actually mentioned with some of the other um, sector speakers as well. A lot of it is awareness training for everybody in the MTS um, because so many of these attacks occur because humans are socially engineered. But okay. at the same time, I would like to say we have to stop throwing our hands up in the air and saying, you know, oh my goodness, it's the users. Um, because that implies that we're giving the users secure systems to begin with, that the people are somehow screwing up. The fact is we're using operating systems that are not secure. We have applications that are not secure. And you only have to look at the number of patches that are coming out constantly to demonstrate that we're working with systems that are not as secure as they should be, so which gives the users not really a chance. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, yield back the time. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize um, Mr. Larson for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. My first question is for Mr. Stevens. 
you could prepare, um, Mr. Stevens. The U.S. aviation sector is very complex. It's made up of various entities and stakeholders responsible for different aspects of it. Uh, have you considered how the complexity of the U.S. aviation system, though, then uh, makes that system more vulnerable to cyber attacks or less vulnerable because of the complexity? Uh, how do you look at, how do you approach that? Uh, that's an excellent question, Congressman. In a way, I think uh, it makes it more vulnerable, and here's why. Uh, I'll give you an example. The MTA attack uh, that was mentioned earlier, it affects uh, New York. Uh, it could create delays. It can create some safety risks, but it doesn't impact maybe the metropolitan transportation system in San Francisco. However, a cyber attack in New York at JFK or one of the other major airports in that area would very well not only impact because of the connectivity uh, the airport in San Francisco, but across the globe potentially. So I, it's, it's much more global, I think, in scope and approach. Also, I think you have so many interdependent pieces. You have air traffic control systems, particularly the shift from terrestrial based air traffic control management uh, to satellite based air traffic control management with next gen. There are significant issues with the interference and cyber hacking potentially of signals and satellites that create uh, the position awareness for those aircrafts and for controllers to be able to control those aircraft. My previous life, I was an air traffic control in the Air Force, and I will tell you, being able to have positive control and everything in your airspace is of paramount importance for obvious reasons. So for those reasons, I do believe that there is greater complexity because there are more interoperating systems, and there's a much broader landscape to cover, geographically speaking. Does the um, uh, FCC's decision on 5G, where the aviation sector expressed concerns about the size of the, the buffer between uh, mid-band mid, uh, mid uh, wasn't wide enough to protect aviation, does that do you see that as an additional vulnerability or is that a separate issue for, uh, for the aviation sector? I see that as an additional vulnerability. Anything that potentially impacts the safe uh, navigation in our airspace, whether it's from 5G or whether it's interference with global positioning satellites or any other type of malicious intrusion or unintentional intrusion becomes a huge issue. It's a force multiplier. And our colleagues from the maritime space and uh, you know the uh, surface transportation, they're all dealing with the same things. However, it's a little bit different when you're cruising at 500 miles per hour and 40,000 feet. You don't have that much room for error. Uh, and that isn't being said to minimize the situation with any of the other represented sectors. However, the consequence of error in aviation uh, potentially are significantly greater. So anything that impedes the safe flow uh, in that airspace is a huge issue that we all have to make sure that we're coordinating on. Yeah, thank you. I uh, want to shift to um, Ms. Sam, uh, Samford, please, um, if you could prepare, uh, just to ask you about the um, incident command for industrial control systems uh, and, the, and the model for the national incident management system. Um, you discussed applying that in private sector response mainly, uh, but is is that response is that system adaptable to all industries is it, is it a template we can just pick up and put down or do you anticipate within the transportation sector it would have to be modified uh, industry by industry that that's a, a wonderful question and thank you for it congressman larson uh, incident command system is used globally. It was recently endorsed by the United Nations. So it's really a model. It's a framework that sits on top of existing plans. So it's it's really industry or sector agnostic. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not sure the uh, UN endorsement would please some of the members on, on, in, the, in the US House, but <laughs> that's fine. Um, with regards to um, Back, back to Mr. Stevens briefly then, I've got 30 seconds total. Um, how can Congress incentivize the, in aviation, uh, uh, the aviation sector to address cybersecurity issues? Are there specific points that we ought to do other than what you've mentioned in your testimony? I think there are some specific things, Congressman, very quickly in the interest of time. I think there needs to be more investment, uh, first of all. If you look at the TSA, uh, proposed guidance out there that requires all these 
uh, different things. They're good things. They're headed notionally in the right direction, but without investment, without developing the capacity and capability and workforce, they're just prescriptions that can't really be met. When you've seen one airport, you've only seen one airport. They're different in size and scope and resources. So every airport that's a commercial airport wouldn't be able to achieve that. So if I had to give you one thing, it would be more focused investment in talent development as well as resources to meet any prescriptions that are uh, sent down from Congress or TSA. Thank you very much. Next, I call on uh, Mr. Webster for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Kessler, uh, my first question is to you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the unique, uh, maybe the unique problems with, with autonomous uh, shipping. Uh, was there, you mentioned one example and that was a lookout. Are there other things that are, would be unique to the, and uh, maybe bring on new hazards and so forth as far as cybersecurity um, in the area of autonomous shipping? Um, there are some things with the autonomous vessels, but that, that also actually impact the, the non-autonomous vessels. Autonomous vessels, of course, are going to be um, highly reliant on position navigation and timing systems, which is to say GPS. Um, they're also highly re reliant on situational awareness systems, such as the automatic ID system, that allows vessels that are in proximity to identify themselves to other vessels in terms um, not just of location, but also uh, course, heading, rate of turn, destination, speed, um, all that kind of stuff. I mean, much more than, for example, radar would give you. Um, those systems are also um, highly uh, unsecure. Um, Mr. Stevens referred to a little bit about the importance that aviation has for GPS. Maritime in, in also has the same reliance, and that reliance, once we get into the near coastal waters, is particularly important. Um, a, as an example, if I can somehow um, spoof your GPS signal and make you go off course by 100 meters or so in the open ocean, well, that's not good, but it's not terrible. If I cause you to go 100 meters off course in Kill Van Cull, as you're going into the port of New York and New Jersey, that's a big problem because I can now block the entire port. Um, so that, that, is, that is one of the issues that we have. Um, the situational awareness system that I mentioned, AIS, also um, is not terribly secure and can be easily spoofed. And we've seen some, uh, you know, the more egregious demonstrations of that in the Black Sea during the NATO exercises last June. Um, but, but, it, but again, going back to the autonomous vessels, um, it's not just the lookouts, it's also the entire um, being able to control the vessel. And if I can get something to go off course, um, obviously that is, um, I, I think, a big, a big potential problem with those vessels. Thank you very much. Mr. Stevens. Can you tell me at Tampa International Airport, there are, uh, I guess you had mentioned that there have been great strides made as far as uh, cybersecurity, but on the other hand, there also, you've picked up some strides on the other side uh, from attacks and so forth. Can you elaborate on that any more? Uh, Congressman, yes. What I what I will tell you is that most airports, particularly your large uh, hub airports, which are your 30 largest by traffic, passenger traffic airports, are under attack constantly. We at Tampa International probably defend about 3 million malicious cybersecurity uh, attempts at our network uh, every year. And while we here at uh, Tampa International have done a pretty good job by most standards, we've adopted the NIST standard. We also have adopted aspects of another standard called COVID, uh, we still are looking at making sure how can we harden our network? How can we train our employees to recognize these threats and attacks? And the problem with uh, cybersecurity defense, you know, we have to be right almost 100% of the time. You know, the bad guys don't have to be uh, right all the time. They have to be able to get at us one good time and you can really disrupt some things. So 
in, in, in summary, it's just an enormous, enormous challenge out there. The good thing is, though, that we don't do it alone. Uh, everything from CISA to TSA to uh, the FBI and all of our partners, there's a great information sharing and exchange, uh, as Mr. Farmer alluded to, in the rail industry. We do the same thing in aviation by, by you know, mandate. Um, so we're not strangers to uh, mandatory information sharing. Again, as I stated uh, before, it's the nature and the quality of what we share that's really going to make the difference. Uh, USF is um, out of the university system. University of South Florida has been one of the designated uh, cybersecurity uh, hotspots. Have they? Are they part of your team too? Uh, that's a great question. We do a lot of uh, work with uh, the cybersecurity um, groups around here, particularly coming out of USF. They hold a, a fantastic conference. We send some of our folks to that conference. Uh, to participate, but again, I think we can do even more, maybe getting them involved in more tabletop exercises and things of that nature, but we do participate with those local groups such as USF. Thank you very much. Go back. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Carson for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, at, as a former law enforcement officer who worked at our Indiana Intelligence Fusion Center. Uh, I'm always concerned um, about making sure that information sharing is strong. And I know how critical it is for federal officers to share timely and detailed information with local and state partners. Tell us what 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 is working well. Uh, what 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 needs to be improved, and and what do you recommend to improve the flow of information to strengthen cybersecurity for transportation and even infrastructure. Well, if I can say a few words um, about maritime and, and I will keep this short, um, there's a very strong reporting requirement, at least within US waters and possibly even with all US flag vessels, the, the few that we have, that they report on any safety issue to the US Coast Guard. We're only now really beginning to view cybersecurity as a safety issue. And so while the mechanism in place, at least again in maritime and US waters to provide information to the Coast Guard, we need to have some better reporting structure and requirements for, um, for those cybersecurity issues to get reported up. Um, there's a lot of work being done that all of the, um, all of the ports in the United States uh, need to have a facility security plan. And now they have to have a cybersecurity amendment to that plan. So the, the, the process is moving, albeit a little bit slowly. I would, um, this is, I would say from the transit perspective, um, there's a, there is a lot of communication that comes from the major um, transit associations, um, particularly APTA. They have a number of committees um, that communicate, that, that uh, communicate with their members. Um, both large and small, uh, a lot of standard development. Ashto also has um, has a um, a committee that works largely with with the smaller and rural transit associations. So there's a lot of communication that in that regard. Um, and then TSA uh, works closely with uh, with those associations. Um, and I think what you're starting to see, is a greater um, greater engagement by this administration um, in cybersecurity, and as a result, you're starting to see uh, greater engage greater engagement by the administration, both uh, obviously from DHS, but now even at at the Department of Transportation level with the industry, and that's something that's new. Thank you, um, Farmer. Very if I could, sir. Oh. Uh, on the point of information sharing, what's working well uh, among sectors in transportation is cross-sector sharing through the different information sharing and analysis centers for aviation, oil and natural gas, uh, for public transportation, uh, the railway alert network that we manage. And that has been very helpful in organizations understanding what others are seeing in transportation 
from a cybersecurity perspective. And that gives insight. If you're considering attackers, they likely haven't gone after one transportation entity. They're likely going around among several to try to find opportunities. And so that sharing of indicators of cybersecurity concern can be very valuable for our awareness. I think importantly for the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, it's those sort of signals that can help them determine whether what's happening is indicative, indicative of a pattern, of trends, of a potential developing threat that merits attention. So that prospect's working very well. And there's a group that the TSA administrators appointed called the Surface Transportation Security Advisory Committee. It's a direction that Congress gave in the uh, TSA Modernization Act of 2018. And it comprises representatives of each of the surface transportation modes, uh, security support experts, uh, state and local government representatives. And that committee earlier this year made 18 unanimous recommendations to the TSA administrator, all of which he has accepted. Four of them focus on cybersecurity information sharing with the aim of building this early notification network of sharing among sectors of what they're seeing so that their colleagues can understand what the potential threats are. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back. I call on Mr. Massey for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I, found, I find this hearing somewhat terrifying. Uh, it's based on the premise that federal involvement in ensuring cybersecurity in the private sector is either necessary or sufficient. It is, it's not either of those things. Uh, and so I am worried. I mean, asking this committee to come up with standards for platforms in cybersecurity is a little bit like asking my cattle to write a term paper on Shakespeare's, uh, one of Shakespeare's works. I mean, we're just not qualified to do it. And I'm gonna include myself in that. I have an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. All that qualifies me to do is to know what I don't know. And I am terrified at what we don't know. If, if some legislation comes out of this, and maybe it's already written, probably already written. If it's gonna be written, it's gonna be written by the vendors who continuously fail to protect the, the, um, the assets of the federal government and the private sector. And, and um, so with that, I, I wanna ask Mr. Kessler, can you tell us what a zero trust architecture uh, solution is and, and why that might have advantages over some of the other architectures in the context of cybersecurity? Well, um, actually there were, there were a number of things that you said that um, since your, your background, well, I didn't go to MIT, but matches mine. Um, so, so the zero trust architecture, it, it's basically, in my view, a relatively recent buzzword um, for trying to put together the idea that I start out with not trusting any entity with whom I communicate. And so trust has to be designated. And it's a way of controlling access, not only to the fact that you and I can communicate, but in fact, what we're going to communicate about, what you have access to. And again, I don't give you access to anything except that which I have specifically given you access. However, you mentioned a point that I, I would like to say a few words about. Well, okay, if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll allow you to do that. Okay. I want to, All right. Uh, the zero trust architecture, is it possible to build that on top of say a Microsoft operating system? I believe you can at the application level. Um, I'll, I'll keep it there. Yes, I believe you could. Okay, I believe you can't because if you're using the Microsoft operating system, you're getting updates from a vendor that you implicitly have to trust or else the operating system does not work. You're also getting a, an operating system that you can't audit. No audit is possible. Microsoft would not give you that level of access to know that if you have a, a platform. But I, I, I will allow you that the application itself might be zero trust. And I think that was your answer. You're obviously more knowledgeable in this than me. I'm just trying to point out to the, everybody else that everything underneath of that application cannot be trusted because you can't audit it. And so, uh, I, I want to go on and just say, uh, Mr. Belcher, you uh, talked about the vast unwashed and you were shocked that a CEO of a transit company didn't know how to secure a Zoom meeting. 
you know, would, would you be willing to put a, a million dollars in bond and we hire a hacker and see if you can protect a Zoom meeting? No. Okay, I wouldn't either because from a, from a directed focused attack, it's really not even possible this, to, to guarantee that. Uh, Ms. Stamford, you use the words consistency, interoperability, uniform and coordinated. Every hacker's getting excited when they hear that. They, it's like every castle has the same defense. And, uh, and by the way, you have to trust the vendor. So it's like every castle's guard at the gate work, doesn't work for the people inside the castle. It works for somebody else. And they all use the same secret knock. And so you could get in the door uh, if, by trusting this vendor. And so uh, the, hackers love these words, consistency, interoperability, uniform, and coordinated. This is what allows them to hack not just one person on any given day, but 10,000 uh, companies on any given day. I would, I'm running out of time. I would suggest that if Congress has any role here in mandating anything, it would be to have audits and audits that are not written by the vendors. Audits that are third party audits that test penetrated, penetration testing of these systems. Otherwise, if you let vendors audit themselves, it's not going to work. And with that, I, I yield back and somebody gives me more time. I'd love to go on. <laughs> the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Payne for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Belcher. Um, under the Rail Safety Improvement Act of 2008, Congress mandated that all class one railroads and commuter and inner city passenger rail providers to install positive tra train control systems. Positive train control systems work to prevent unsafe movements and accidents by using an in information network to regulate trains positions. However, information networks can be vulnerable to bad actors and must have adequate cybersecurity protections. How should freight railroads and commuter and inner city passenger rail providers best protect uh, these critical systems and what, what consequences could result from a cyber incident of PTC systems? Well, I think Mr. Farmer is probably better qualified to respond to that question than I am, um, okay. given his background. All right, Mr. Farmer. Yes, sir. Uh, excellent question. Positive train control is a safety overlay to our operations. And I think what's significant here is as opposed to many of the industrial control systems that we've seen uh, hacked, a lot of them are older systems, not designed with cyber threats in mind. A PTC has been specifically designed uh, with cyber threats in mind. Uh, and in particular, through the Rail Information Security Committee, which I referenced earlier in testimony, a, a concerted effort was devoted to coordinating with a national laboratory, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, to do the sort of work that's been referenced a number of times in this hearing, to look at how the system was designed, uh, to take the view of an adversary, uh, to conduct penetration type activity, to determine where potential vulnerabilities might be and enable as the development process proceeded of those matters to be addressed with effective cybersecurity measures. Built into PTC, you have uh, in particular uh, network segmentation, uh, advanced encryption, uh, short-term access authorizations for moving trains, uh, all of which are designed to narrow the possibility that one, a breach can happen, or secondly, if it does, it can spread beyond the limited uh, site in the network. So it has been a concerted effort and developed with cyber threats in mind with support of government through the National Laboratory and through the proactive information sharing work we do with CIS and TSA. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, Mr. Farmer, the good cyber hygiene is very important to protect against uh, potential consequences um, that you just articulated. Um, as chairman of the Railroads, Pipelines, and Hazardous Materials Subcommittee, I have a responsibility to ensure that freight railroads meet the evolving threat of cyber attacks. Your testimony makes it clear that AAR opposes TSA security directives. 
What assurances can you give this committee that freight railroads have taken the steps necessary to deal with a cyber attack targeting these critical systems? So the insurance is demonstrated in the experience of what we do in the industry, an experience that's well known to our partners in government. I mentioned earlier the committee that we have focused on cybersecurity more than two decades in duration. That group convenes twice monthly. It is an effective forum for sharing information on cybersecurity concerns and on effective practices to mitigate risk. Uh, the sorts of sound fundamental measures that are taken across our industry include training for users on networks, uh, drills of that training to make sure that the, the learning uh, is tested and evaluated, uh, exercises conducted within the railroad, conducted with TSA through its inter, uh, intermodal security training and exercise program, and a national level industry exercise we hold every year, where we take actual cyber incidents that have happened in other industries and posit what would we do in the railroad industry if faced with similar situations. And that gets into the a key measure here, which are the well-developed preparedness and incident response plans that railroads maintain and constantly exercise, constantly refine based on the assessments we do, based on what we learn, uh, in particular from our interaction with government on the nature of the evolving threat. Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Mr. Perry for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Belcher, your testimony explains that even the transition to electric buses brings with it a whole new level of cyber exposure and other security risks not previously anticipated. Given the majority's push to electrify everything with regard to the without regard to the consequences, this statement may fall on deaf ears, but I think it's important to ensure everyone here knows what you mean by that statement. Can you tell us how much greater is the cyber exposure of an electric bus fleet relative to a diesel bus fleet? Well, it just, um, it simply creates a, a new threat vector in, this, in the sense that anytime you add a new, a new opportunity, a new di digital connection, you, add, you, you create a new opportunity for um, an adversary to access, access your network. So are you talking and about things like the ability to degrade batteries remotely, cause fires, manually take over controls of the vehicle, that kind of thing? Yes, you're, you're, you've created an opportunity to access the network. But, so, but, but, but you're talking about sophisticated um, companies that are far more sophisticated and they, that are building in protections into their into their into their bus systems and into their networks. So I think I think well there there are risks there are risks that come with that new risks that we never thought about. These are sophisticated companies that are building in cybersecurity protections as they as they as they build as they develop these new these new technologies. But would you also say then I mean based on that yeah, they're building in protections, but haven't uh, computer companies and automation companies built in security protocols all along, but yet they've still been breached over and over and over again? 100%. We'd, we'd be far safer if we were still running um, diesel buses that were not connected to anything and that were and that had no digital connections to anything. Right, okay, so your, your testimony cites the 2020 Meta Transportation Institute report on cybersecurity in the transit sector extensively. This report, or cor correction, presents some pretty damning conclusions. As you noted, the 2020 MTI report concludes that for many transit agencies, internal resources for cybersecurity are scarce, and you go on to cite reports finding that 43% of the agencies do not believe they have the resources necessary for cybersecurity preparedness. To me, this raises a legitimate question about what exactly the taxpayer is getting back for the tens of billions of dollars per year that the FTA provides to transit agencies and the nearly 90 billion we've given them in the past two fiscal years. I mean, if transit agencies have failed to invest in protecting their cybersecurity systems, and have failed to do regular maintenance and upkeep, leaving more than 100 billion in state of good repair backlog, both allegedly due to lack of resources. What, what in the hell are they spending their money on? 
you know, I, that's. Yeah, I, I guess that's probably not a fair question. Let me ask you this. It really isn't a fair, yeah, okay. I, I, think, I, I think the answer to that question might result of uh, be a result of Section 13C of the Urban Mass Transit Act providing for employee protective arrangements or agreements that effectively provide uh, labor union leadership veto power over any potential federal grants to their employer, which gives union leadership unparalleled negotiating leverage to force transit agencies to cave in to their demands. This requirement is largely, in my opinion, responsible for the steep decline in transit worker productivity after it was enacted in 1964, despite the fact that nearly every other industry saw significant productivity increases. It's also a significant contributing factor to the sector's uniquely high labor costs as a percentage of operating costs and massive unfunded pension liabilities. Given this background, would you agree that Section 13C needs to be either repealed or at the very least significantly reformed so that transit operators are able to invest necessary resources to protect from physical and cyber threats. I have no opinion on that. All right, uh, how about uh, uh, the authors of the report emphasize the FAA should require transit organizations to adopt and implement minimum cybersecurity standards prior to receiving federal funding. Where do you stand on that? I agree. There you go, thank you, Madam Chair, I yield balance. The, the gentleman yields. Uh, I now call Mr. Chabacol. Chabacol for five minutes. Thank you, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Stevens, uh, you highlight the importance of cybersecurity information sharing and communication. You also highlight how information sharing between the government and the private sector has not been as effective as it could be because it is voluntary. What should be considered when thinking of legislation regarding mandatory cybersecurity information sharing and communication between the government and the private sector. Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Uh, one of the things, I'll start from this perspective, before legislation is struck, I think there has to be robust dialogue with the um, entities or the sectors that are going to be regulated. Uh, sometimes moving too quickly to get something out uh, significantly creates more obstacles and more bureaucratic uh, red tape and impairs the cybersecurity preparedness of, of certain agencies as many of us have spoken about. To that end though, uh, a voluntary structure where there is no enforcement is relatively meaningless. You have to have some mechanism for enforcement. So it is not a one size kind of fits all approach. It's a holistic approach that I think our federal government has to take towards cybersecurity. I'll give you a primary example. Under FISMA, which uh, CIS is responsible for reviewing all of the federal agencies, right? The vast majority of them have received Ds. So the question becomes if we can't, you know, under FISMA, which has been struck some time ago, can't police the cyber hygiene of our own federal agencies, it's a very difficult hurdle to then create mandates that are not attainable uh, for other covered sectors. So uh, involvement with those covered sectors and getting really um, solid advice and perspective before those things come out is important. And I'll, find, I'll, I'll finish with this. Uh, again, going back to the, you know, the TSA proposal, uh, for example, there was a 24-hour um, time reporting requirement under that proposed guidance. Most uh, entities who have cyber incidents cannot begin to even do analysis on anything uh, with respect uh, to a cyber incursion in order to be able to meet that requirement uh, versus what is uh, happening in the Department of Defense under the National Defense Authorization Act is a 72-hour requirement. So, you know, in short, I think that while mandatory reporting requirements are great, it's what do we report and how do we report those things. Thank you very much. Dr. Kessler, uh, you're an educator on the topic of cybersecurity at the US Coast Guard Academy. And I'm interested in your insight into the importance of cybersecurity training programs uh, to strengthen our defenses. Your recent report, Raising the Colors, highlighted the need for industry recognized certification in both information technology and operational technology fields and the creation of cybersecurity training programs by the Coast Guard 
and the Department of Transportation. With the support of the Department of Energy, the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the State Department and international organizations as vital to cybersecurity improvements. Could you discuss the need for standardized training and certification in the nation's cyber defenses? Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think we need to have certain standardization um, so that everybody is at least getting the same baseline understanding and is on the same page of what it is we're trying to protect. Um, I think it is incredibly important to recognize through this, and particularly as you are all considering you know, legislation, um, I agree again with um, what Mr. Stevens just said about working closely with stakeholders. The solution to cyber is not solely a technology solution. Um, I will pull out an old quote that says anyone who thinks that technology can solve their problems doesn't understand technology and doesn't understand their problems. If, if people are a big part of the problem, then people have to be a big part of the solution and technology can't save them because people who don't know what they're doing can always get around um, the technology. So, so that's why the training is so incredibly important and, and there does need to be a certain global aspect to it since the ships are going everywhere and coming from everywhere and can carry you know, malicious software and viruses from port to port. Um, and so, so again, the, the, the training has to be on the technology level so that we have the appropriate number of technologists in the field, as has already been discussed, that we're way short on the number of cybersecurity practitioners but essentially today, everybody has become a cybersecurity practitioner since we're all carrying around multiple devices that we need to secure. Thank you. Uh, I'm out of time. I yield back now, Chair. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Mr. Davis for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to uh, all of the witnesses today. I'd like to start my questioning with Mr. Farmer. Uh, Mr. Farmer, uh, do your members usually subscribe to more of a centralized cybersecurity operation at their specific railroads, or is it more decentralized? Well, what you have with uh, railroads is through the headquarters elements, you have cybersecurity and expertise through chief information security officers, uh, specialists in cybersecurity, uh, well-trained personnel on the cybersecurity staff, who notably participate in a training program hosted by Idaho National Laboratories, which looks at networks from a red teaming perspective and allows them to conduct penetration operations and learn what the adversary is looking to accomplish. Uh, so in that sense, what you have is probably something akin to my experience in the Air Force, centralized control, uh, but decentralized execution in terms of allowing the experts to apply their skills in ensuring network cybersecurity posture is maintained. So, so the decentralized portion of your response there is, is indicative of, do you believe it's easier to, to, for a cybersecurity criminal to hack a more centralized system that's just in one location uh, versus a, a system you just described that many of your members use? I think the key on, on what's easier for an adversary to hack comes down to the network architecture. And that's where the emphasis placed by railroads on ensuring network segmentation and on strong controls for access, where well, those efforts are vital. So it's not so much whether it's a single point versus multiple points. It's more along the lines of how are you designing the network architecture and putting in your layered cyber defenses in a way that creates opportunities to detect, disrupt, and prevent adversaries from inflicting harm. I it just seems to me that it'd be easier for our adversaries to, to go after systems that are uniquely intertwined at, at all levels rather than decentralized, which I seem to, to I guess I'm understanding your response to say that uh, you do have somewhat of a decentralized approach for uh, possible redundancy issues and, and security issues. Uh, what would you recommend we do when it comes to transportation systems at the federal level when we certainly um, rely upon much more of a top-down approach when it comes to other systems in place 
what can we do to copy this more decentralized approach and thus make it more secure? Well, I think your point on redundancy is exceptionally well taken. A lot of effort devoted in the industry to establishing backups, backups for programs and files, uh, backups for operational control systems. And so you have multiple options should one component be adversely impacted for the operation to continue. You know, I think what we've seen, particularly over the past several months in terms of cyber intrusions, is, is you see in the CISA advisories on these events, this reference to highly sophisticated threat actors employing very well-developed tactics that reflect a great deal of understanding of networks. And I think there's two challenges that come into play there. Uh, one is in many cases, these are referred to as supply chain vulnerabilities where the adversary has determined, has identified a vulnerability present in a particular software application and done the necessary surveillance of a network to exploit it. And CISA frequently recommends that railroads, other critical infrastructure organizations engage with their suppliers. And we do that in the industry through a dedicated group with our key suppliers. But there's a key element in terms of what Congress can do, I think that merits attention. And that is one of the CISA recommendations is you should be getting from your suppliers a software bill of materials. And essentially that's the delineation of all the software elements in the vehicle, equipment, device that you have procured so that you as the end user know what, what software is included and what versions are present. So when these issues come up with these supply chain vulnerabilities and you need to know quickly, am I affected? The software bill of materials gives you the means to do that, that sort of reference. And the second question that comes up is, are we doing enough in terms of deterrence? We've talked a great deal in this hearing about network defense and that's vital. But a concern that we have in the private sector is you know, in contrast to mitigating terrorism risk, which entailed a great deal of effort internationally in intelligence and military operations, uh, the adversary's boldness, particularly over these past several months with these highly sophisticated attacks, indicates they're not getting a deterrent message. And that's part of an effective strategy. Thank right, you. I, thank you. I'd like to yield my remaining time to Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Lady. And I yield the time that Representative Davis gave me to uh, Thomas the Hitman Massey. <laughs> if there is any time remaining, I'd like to allow there really Mr. Kessler. Okay. <laughs> You'll have to wait to, for, for someone else to yield because all of that time has now expired. Yes, Madam Chairwoman. <laughs> and I am forced to. I'm, I'm sorry, Chair Lady, for that disruption. <laughs> I have not had my Mountain Dew this morning. I apologize. All right. Uh, I, I now recognize. Mr. Stanton for five minutes. Madam Chair, thank you so much for recognizing me. I want to thank uh, Chairman DeFazio for holding this important hearing. I want to thank each of the witnesses here today for providing important testimony on this critically important issue that is growing in concern. Cyber attacks against our water systems have become more frequent, sophisticated, and dangerous. Back in February, a hacker gained access to the Oldsmar water treatment facility in Florida. Their goal was to increase the level of sodium hydroxide, otherwise known as lye, in the drinking water. While Oldsmar was lucky that the facility's operator was at his computer and watching the hacker's attempts in real time, the results, if they had been successful, could have been seriously harmful to residents and businesses who rely on that water for drinking water. Approximately 90% of our country's public water supplies and 80% of the wastewater utilities are small and serve fewer than 10,000 people. The hack at Oldsmar demonstrates the vulnerability of small systems and the challenges they face in preparing for and responding to these threats. Compared to larger water systems, these systems have smaller budgets, limited resources, sometimes only a small number of employees to handle a significant amount of work. A cyber attack is just one more challenge they confront, so they must be strategic in how they approach this constantly evolving threat. Mr. Sullivan, you mentioned in your testimony that Boston Water and Sewer Commission, where you are the chief engineer, you suffered from a ransomware attack last year. What do you believe are the lessons learned from that attack and one in 
that I described in Oldsmar for other water and wastewater utilities, particularly small, rural, and tribal systems where they might not have, a, might not have as much access to staff with cyber expertise or financial resources. Well, thank you, Congressman. Um, we, we have been working many years to build up our cyber preparedness, uh, along with most of your large water systems and wastewater systems. The problem we had was this, it was a human element. One of our staffers allowed an email, a phishing email, and he opened it up and he did not report that there was nothing there when he opened it up. What happened there is some malware got into our system of BarkBark and it sat and for sat for over a month because we were able to trace it back later. The human element here is our biggest weakness. Um, and, and we know that we've got all kinds of systems. We, our firewalls are secure. We're stopping things every day. We're getting attacked every day. The cybersecurity uh, awareness, a culture of awareness in every system is the most important thing we need to do. And that is we need to get to, to training. Um, many of these small systems you're recognizing they're struggling with making sure we get pure water out there, that we're struggling with the new regulations of contaminants. On the wastewater group, the same thing. We, we struggle with producing the product that we're required to do. And many of the small ones may have IT systems that they don't even know how they run. They hired someone, they came in, a miracle occurred, all of a sudden you could operate from home and, and life was good. They don't have the awareness, and that's what we're trying to do through the ISAC, is continually remind people, pay attention, read these, oh, oh, we work with sister, et cetera, read all these reports, make sure you're doing this, but they don't have the resources to hire people to check everything out. And that is one of the major hurdles we have yeah. because we do have 50,000 water systems and 16,000 wastewater systems. You mentioned ISAC, the Water Information Sharing and Analysis Center, which was established of course 10 years ago to provide water utilities with critical information on threats both physical and cyber related, along with best practices for preventing and responding to those attacks. Uh, I mentioned in earlier tribal communities um, and challenges that the water systems on tribal communities face. I wanted you to address that. What specific outreach or work has ISAC done with our tribal communities? And if not, do you have plans to reach out to our tribal communities to make it a, a part of its work? The, the ISAC is a subscription service. We have over 400 members that cover much of the nation. Um, but we also have the states. The states are part of the ISAC. They get all our information so that the states, through their resources, can reach out to smaller systems, the tribals, et cetera. Um, we, we are asking for additional resources to have the subscriptions for everyone, every water and wastewater systems um, paid for so that we can reach everyone and give them the, the help they need to, we wanna be able to take these threats and boil them down to what it means for each size system so that they can look at them. They don't have to All read right. these lengthy documents for anybody. I'm out of time, but my re request is that maybe ISAC yeah. will reach out to those tribal communities and the water systems there. It's so critically important that we provide clean water to our tribal members. And often they don't have the same resources as others, but they have the same needs for their community. So my request is that ISAC see what they can do to better reach out to our tribal communities in Arizona and around the country. Thank you, I yield back. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Babin for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm so glad we're having this hearing today uh, for this committee to weigh in on the issue of cybersecurity in the transportation and critical infrastructure space. It's a great responsibility and one that we should all take very seriously. It's also very timely. Just yesterday, the director of CISA told the House Homeland Security Committee that, quote, ransomware has become a scourge in nearly every facet of our lives, and it's a prime example of the vulnerabilities that are emerging as our digital and our physical infrastructure increasingly converge. She went on to say that, quote, the American way of life faces serious risks. She's right. Internet attacks are a full-fledged standard feature of our modern life. Hardly even a day passes anymore without a media story coming out about a cyber threat or an attack. These threats are disruptive, they're costly, potentially life-threatening. All of us saw what happened with the Colonial Pipeline breach last May, 
and how that attack led to gas shortages and, excuse me, and interrupted supply chains. There is certainly a, a legitimate and appropriate role for the federal government to play in protecting the American people and our companies and businesses against theft, espionage, and cyber attacks. No question, this is a fight for our national security. However, cyber intrusions are very hard to track. We've got to be extraordinarily careful as lawmakers that we don't, don't meddle in something that we don't properly understand and unintentionally cause bloated regulation or stifle innovation with overly burdensome requirements that don't truly secure our infrastructure. Any policy we push forward has got to be aggressive but consistent with our nation's founding principles, meaning that we provide for the common defense while at the same time protecting civil liberties and the free economic uh, economy. A former director of national intelligence uh, and my former Texas colleague and friend, John Ratcliffe, said that we need to attribute these attacks and either to overtly or covertly retaliate against those responsible, creating deterrence for the future. I could not agree more. There has to be a downside for these enemies, and inflicting appropriate pain for their attacks is not only justified, but I think absolutely necessary. If our long-term strategy to cyber criminals is to just pay the ransom and hope for the best with cyber insurance, we will certainly lose to our foes in this new battlefront. So my question to all of you, and I'll open this up to anyone who would like to uh, answer this, what are common sense steps that we as lawmakers can take uh, to help the private sector better protect themselves and better report cyber uh, threats to the proper government entities without infringing on people's civil liberties or the free market? I would open that up, please. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think one of the, one of the key things that um, organizations can and should do to protect against ransomware is to make sure that they keep um, adequate logs, data logs. Um, and, and that's one of the things you see, particularly with small, smaller or less sophisticated organizations. Um, and if, you if you're keeping adequate data logs, you can, re you can go back and recreate everything that happened prior to the hack. And that way um, you can avoid having to pay a ransom. And that's the, that's the best way that you can manage uh, against, against ransom attacks. And so anything that, um, that Congress can do to encourage that, I'm not saying that you mandate um, data logs. It, it is good hygiene. It is something that uh, trade associations should be encouraging and should be uh, providing um, guidance on and it's, it's something that we should all be pushing for because it, it is the best thing that you can do to, to, to mitigate against ransom, ransomware because it's <clears throat> happening every day. Thank you, anyone else? Yes, um, sir, thank you. And I think that it's an excellent question. Thank you, Congressman Batten. I, I always tell owners and operators, there are a few top things that they can do. Number one is to have a complete asset inventory. You can't protect what you don't know about. The second is to understand if you have direct exposure to the internet. I think that Congress would be very frightened if they were to examine the number of critical infrastructures that have industrial control systems that remain directly connected to the internet. That is an immediate and direct source. If I were Congress, if I, if I were in that position, I would direct all designated critical infrastructures within the United States to ensure that they do not have any devices directly connected. That would immediately eliminate tons of exposure and risk. And, and lastly, I, I'd like to redirect and go, and go back to the point on ICS for ICS and that every single local fire department, every emergency services, even our military, it is the way that we mobilize to, to respond to events. Out of all of the nationally declared disaster types, cyber is the only one that is not mandated currently to follow incident command system. I can tell you that uh, being prepared and being able to mobilize the private sector, which is where 85% of your response resources will come from in the event of a nationwide attack, you will want a system like ICS to integrate. By no means does having a common framework for response increase our risk or our threat. Those threats and risks are already there. 
all it does is give us an advantage over the enemy and effectively bouncing back from those attacks. Thank you very much. And my time is out, and so I will yield back. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank the you. next Congress member will be Congress member Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my district recently suffered through one of the most intense hurricanes to ever make landfall in the United States. Hearing about the dangers threatening our systems through cyber attacks, I can't help but be concerned about what would happen if bad actors took advantage of a natural disaster to launch a cyber attack. According to a re recent article on the topic, natural disasters can set, off, set the stage for cyber attacks. Secu security experts say that they're not aware of any major cyber attacks against a state or local government during a natural disaster. But that's only a matter of time if we aren't careful and to prepare for these things. And if a hacker launched a disruption to coincide with a natural disaster, that could uh, greatly hamper first responders, hospitals, utilities, government agencies. According to the National Association of State Chief Information Officers, this is a real threat. So I'll ask this question of you, Mr. Sullivan. Municipal water systems in many areas have to cope with threats of physical damage from natural disasters. I shudder to think what would happen if a natural disaster occurred in a near proximity to a natural disaster. Can you share your thoughts with me on that? And do you think that any local systems um, should train and practice for responding to a dual threat scenario like this? Uh, certainly. Um, the first, the ISAC was formed because of the events of 9-11. And for the first 10 years, we spent all of our time talking about physical threats and natural hazards and how to make sure you can get your systems up and running. Um, and cyber wasn't really in the forefront at that time because there was no major threats for us on cyber. So we've been training people on, on natural hazards all along, how to do it, how to get yourself back up and running. We all have emergency response plans. The uh, AWARE that Congress passed a couple of years ago required all systems serving 3,300 and more services to look at our uh, natural hazards plan and our cybersecurity plans. And we had to self-certify that we looked at them and we have an emergency response plan. So I would say that most of your systems are definitely capable of getting up and running. Now they can't run with the cyber. A lot of times communications is down, et cetera. They will place people at the plants and they can manually run them. Most of our plants, although highly, they're highly technologically run, can be run manually. We, we are able to run them that way. So we're- Let me ask you, what, what do you think Congress could do to, to make these type of trainings possible and accessible to local governments? Well, there is a lot of training going on. EPA just ran some yesterday uh, with CISA. We're working, American Water Works has put out much training um, and all your water and wastewater national organizations have the training available. The problem is a lot of the smaller systems don't know about it. We haven't been able to reach them to come in and get the training. And that's where the ISAC is trying to expand its reach so that we can give them informed messages, informed information of training for them, their size, and how they can get available. So, And, and maybe this the, is something the, that, that through this committee, uh, Mr. Chair, we, we could utilize our resources to enhance the availability or knowledge uh, to, to local governments of, of this resource. Obviously, it's a threat that... Uh, that could be devastating and having the uh, preparation and training could, could, could really go a very long way. Uh, does anybody else have any, any uh, the other panelists have any thoughts on how Congress could better help um, industries protect against cyber attacks occurring uh, around or during or after natural disasters? Representative Carter, if I could, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the important areas to emphasize in terms of the, the emergencies preparedness is the, the level of a deployment of resources in advance of the storm so that the response and recovery effort happens immediately as soon as safe conditions allow. I think a good point was made earlier about the ability to maintain the capability to conduct manual operations. That is part of how we operate in the road industry in the event there is a electrically or cyber debilitated environment, trains can continue to move under manual procedures. We can also relocate dispatch centers uh, from impacted areas uh, to others. And as I mentioned earlier, 
a key facet of our cyber defense in depth is having backup capabilities and backup files. Uh, I think the point that you're getting to though gets to a broader question of how does private sector across sectors uh, cooperate with government and what can we be focusing attention on? And there's two elements there. One is what are the sorts of cyber attacks that would be most impactful? Uh, whether they're actually happening now or not, looking forward to that potential. Uh, what we deal with now are people looking to exploit the fact that there's a response going on and that there's going to be businesses trying to come into an area and you have a lot of fraud attempts. But what could be done positing a, a potential scenario? And then secondly, then working through the Critical Infrastructure Cross-Sector Council, through CISA, through FEMA, in developing a collective approach to try to address that problem. I think the last aspect gets to a point that was raised in an earlier question. And that is there has to be some deterrent aspect to our cybersecurity strategy. Adversaries need to understand there are limits. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. I Carter. think I'm out of time, I yield back. Thank All you. All right, thank you very much, Representative Carter. Next up will be Congress Member Weber. Congressman Weber, are you there? If not, we'll move uh, to Congressman LaMalfa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the opportunity here today and uh, for witnesses that have uh, gathered online for our, our information here. So um, when, we, when we look at the, you know, a lot of been, lots been covered so far in the hearing today, but uh, uh, with the issue of cybersecurity and I guess uh, my more acute uh, interest in how that would be on small uh, water system, rural, rural water systems and you know, in California, we do have several uh, water districts that distribute water to agriculture, but also they do have hydroelectric power as part of their uh, system as well. So the um, smaller districts have a, have a bigger struggle, probably come up the resources to uh, compete and have the best cybersecurity capabilities that might come against them from China or other terrorism activities. Uh, let me pose to Mr. Sullivan, uh, uh, the analysis center serves districts of all types, all sizes. Uh, you, you had noted some that were quite small with 2,000 residents, or we can shift to agriculture that aren't necessarily residents, but also indeed very important water delivery for what they do. Um, could you touch on, if, if you have already, uh, my apologies, but what are some of the simplest, fastest, uh, lowest cost protections we could be be emphasizing and starting with to help secure those districts, um, especially in a time we have so much unrest and um, potential for for mayhem like that in, in an already stretched economy, stretched water situation like we see in California. What are, what are some of the things that they could be doing very cost effectively and, and quickly and efficiently to tighten up their cybersecurity? Well, right off the bat, EPA has a great site that'll, that'll list all the things they need to do. Um, but what's really important is make sure they don't have their operational technology, their, their SCADA control systems tied into their uh, information systems. It's so easy to get into an information system, um, either through the human nature or they can just hack into it through an email, et cetera. But if you can separate those two right off the bat. Um, so you, a you, separation, you, sir, a, a better yeah. separation, not having, we heard stories about the same uh, access codes and everything for the, so you want to have just a greater separation between the two. Yeah, I want to uh, separate and all the pumps and everything else that are run by technology, separate them from your information systems where you email your, all your other systems. That's a very basic tenant. And if you can do that, you really secure the ability for someone to control your pumping stations, shutting yourself down, uh, overloading your stations, adding chemical where it shouldn't be added. That's critically important because many of the small systems have been braced technology so that they can go home at night and these systems self-operate. And it's so important that they, they separate those. Um, but the data available, it, it's out there. The EPA has done an incredible job. We work with the Water Sector Coordinating Council, DHS, EPA, our sector leader. Um, all this information is, is out there. They just don't know where to go to get to it. And that's the key that we need to get more of. The rural water has riders and they go out and they educate everyone. But keeping updated is important. If everyone thinks that five years ago, they, they took a review of their systems and life was good, and they haven't looked at it again, they've got to look at it again. It's ever-changing. This whole security issue is ever-changing. 
Five years is a very so, long time. Yeah, yeah, it's extremely long time. And the many people we did that. We had a big emphasis. We pushed it, and everyone thought they were all taken care of. And now we have these additional threats. So yeah. when we're talking small districts with you know not huge budgets, with uh, you know if it is rural delivery or agricultural delivery. Uh, do, do you see that it's going to be affordable? Is it going to require a lot of staff or a lot of upgrades in technology and equipment? Or is it something that can be piggybacked onto existing systems if they're halfway modern? I, I think they could be piggybacked. It's $100 to join the Water Ice Act if you're a system below $3,300, $100 a year. There's 40,000 of them, though. And that's one of the problems. They just don't have that $100 or they don't know that they need this issue. Do you, have, do you have confidence, can, sir, that the larger entities like, um, well, the state of California, for example, my, right in my backyard is the Orville Dam and the spillway that uh, broke apart. You'll recover that, you remember that story from a few years ago. Is, is, are, are, do you think the large ones like states are doing what they need to do on, you know, 1960s technology to upgrade those so that they can keep control of their spillway gates and other aspects of their water uh, control systems? I think the larger systems are in very good shape. They're, they're quite aware because of the association of the CIOs talking to each other. So I think there's been a lot of that going on. It's what happens is the medium and small, and they have so many other things tearing apart. Most of your water and sewer operators in the, in the country aren't computer literate. They hire people to come in and set up the systems for them. So they, they're not quite aware of what we're all talking about all the time. The big ones are, we have whole departments dedicated to that. Thank you, appreciate it, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, next up will be Congress Member Lynch. Congressman Lynch, are you on? If not, next will be Con Congress Member Malinowski. Congressman Malinowski, how about uh, Congress Member Kaheli? Congressmember Williams. I am here. Thank you so much. It's your turn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The topic of today's hearing is one that's personal to me and my constituents. I know how critical it is to invest in cybersecurity because my district learned the hard way just three years ago. In 2018, a vicious cyber ransom attack devastated the city of Atlanta. Residents of the 5th District couldn't pay their water bills, police departments lost investigation files, the courts lost legal documents, and it took millions for the city to recover. Our Atlanta airport is owned by the city of Atlanta, and luckily, we only had to shut down our Wi-Fi for the, the duration. What happened in Atlanta is a lesson to be learned from. We need to ensure that we're prepared for any future cyber attacks. And as a member of Congress, I'm dedicated to ensuring what happened to Atlanta won't happen again. Ms. Sanford, what are the contemporary challenges that state and local governments face today in confronting cybersecurity challenges? And what more can Congress do to assist them and ensure information sharing between the private sector and government so we can prepare for and mitigate cyber threats? Great, thank you, Congresswoman Williams, and that's an excellent question. I, I think the, the main thing, honing in on the private sector, I, I think um, coordination and response aspect, is that specifically what you'd like me to touch on is that private sector interaction? Yes. Thank you. In particular, uh, for the private sector, there's no real way for the private sector currently to hook into existing emergency management practices. So I'm sure that you're very familiar with Atlanta you probably have um, an Atlanta Emergency Operations Center and your emergency responders come in there, the different groups from the city of Atlanta, water, wastewater, your energy companies, your electric utilities, they all come in there and support through what are called emergency support functions, ESS. This is part of the incident command system structure that I was speaking of earlier. There needs to be a better mechanism for the private sector to be trained on what incident command system is what their role would be in a disaster in terms of integrating with the government. And then they can actually have representatives that are sitting there in that EOC ready to integrate into your response efforts and reporting up through your incident commanders through the city of Atlanta. So that would be one, recommend, one recommendation is one training the private sector, right? We can start on a voluntary basis and see where that gets us. And secondly, 
have them take their existing response plans. No one's telling them to get rid of what they have. We don't want them to do that. We just want them to learn the overarching government framework that every other first responder is using so that cyber can stop treating itself as something special and get with the program with the rest of the way that the emergency response communities behave. And that way, we can begin to form coordinated responses together. Thank you, Ms. Sanford. And Mr. Belcher, in your testimony, you highlighted that only 60% of transportation agencies have a cybersecurity preparedness program in place. What are the most critical additional resources that Congress can provide to ensure that all transportation agencies are in a strong position to protect themselves from cyber attacks? From agencies that have programs currently in place, what are some of the best practices that agencies should, sure, should be sure to adopt? So I think the first thing that agencies need to do is, is that they need to do an assessment of their, of their cyber um, maturity. Every, every agency has some level of cybersecurity uh, protection, whether they know it or not. Um, cybersecurity protection comes with, your, uh, with your, your Microsoft 360 system. You've got some level of cybersecurity protection. And then, and then, and then many of, your, 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 um, many of your, your more sophisticated um, systems also have protections in them. Um, but many of the operators really don't understand what they have. So you have to understand what you have to understand what you need. So the first thing you need to do is to do an assessment. And then you need, as, um, as Ms. Samper was talking about, is to understand, is to then to bring that into an enterprise system and to treat cybersecurity as just another, it, it becomes another risk. It's another, you know, and you need to manage it as a risk, as one of the many risks that you that you manage, so that it, be, it becomes a, a way of doing business and becomes part of the culture of the business. Most of the most of the the threats are coming, or most of the most of the hacks are coming, not at the IT level, but they're coming through the users and through phishing, through and and, and like, and I think I keep hearing that I'm about to be. Yes, uh, Mr. Belcher, okay. we're running out of time. Okay. And um, before I yield back, Mr. Stevens, I would like to just get some better ideas on how we can address the unique cybersecurity challenges of major airports, with Atlanta being the busiest airport in the country, soon to be in the nation. We're coming back, y'all. But I would love to get some written um, comments on how we can better prepare in Atlanta as um, you discuss what was happening down in Tampa. Thank you, very much. Thank you Mr. Me. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. We'll, we'll ask for a written response to that, uh, that question. Next up will be Congress Member Van Dyne. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to relinquish my time to uh, Congressman Thomas Massey. Uh, I thank the gentlelady from Texas. Um, Ms. Samford, I want to give you a chance to answer my concerns about consistency, interoperability, uniformity, and, and coordinated systems. But before that, I want to highlight something really important you said to one of my other colleagues who talked about the microcontrollers and embedded processors that are connected to the internet that a lot of users don't even know present security vulnerabilities. Just for my colleagues, uh, this is like if you bought a coffee maker or an ice maker or dishwasher and it's, uh, it's connected to the internet when you get it home for your convenience, uh, those things are actually, can be security vulnerabilities, but within, uh, a sewer system, for instance, or a pipeline, they might have things connected to the internet for remote monitoring. So can you talk about that, Ms. Samford, about how you advise your clients and what to do with those things? Sure, and, and thank you, Congressman Massey. It's a really good question. And what we see a lot of, and I don't know that it's uh, specifically with the programmable logic controllers, the PLCs, in many cases, those lack the ability to directly communicate out to the internet, but they certainly could talk through something else. What we see a lot of are what are called human machine interfaces, HMIs, to your point about someone remote accessing in, they would be remoting into that engineering workstation or HMI to see what's going on on that plant floor. In many cases, if you go to a website right now called showdan.com, you can see tens of thousands of HMIs directly connected in the United States and the UK and Australia globally. They're, they're everywhere. And this main point of exposure is that 
Um, right now, I could go to the login screen of this HMI, and if I'm successfully able to log in, say if the um, username is admin and then the password's admin, or if I'm you know, just using a password cracker, I can get into that system within a matter of minutes or hours. And once I'm there, I can see other devices that are on that network because it's the HMI and it tells me that, and I can move laterally to do whatever I need to do. So I always tell people, please, have an up-to-date asset inventory, know what you have so that you can protect it. And secondly, make sure that nothing is talking out directly to the internet. Thank you very much. Um, and did you, I, I didn't give you a chance earlier to respond to my concerns about consistency, interoperability, uniformity, and coordination. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm worried that that, and sometimes that makes it easier for the hackers to hack multiple systems at once. I, I definitely understand and respect your concerns. I think that it it's a credit to you to, to understand the nature of how hackers can work sometimes. I can tell you that the system that I'm talking about, they've already gotten in, they've already performed the attack. So the response structure, the only thing it gives us is the ability to more effectively work with our local state and government officials. And I'm not asking um, you know, that this be mandated at this point, but I am saying that it's really good training. It's how every single fire department responds. It's how if, if someone was injured, the ambulance would show up. It's using the same system. So I would, I would liken it to, you know, I wouldn't say that we would suggest that having all firefighters trained in the country to be able to work together and respond somehow contributes to, you know, terrorist attacks. We don't see that correlation. So we're not seeing that data to suggest that risk at this time, right. but I, I understand your point. I, I was, yes, I was more concerned about like the updates that happen and um, such as that. Um, Mr. Kessler, you had a couple of things you wanted to talk about and we ran out of time. And also if you could throw into that group, you, you talked about the pros and cons of having a human in the loop. It's not always a bad thing to have a human in the loop, I would say. Um, and could you talk about, I'll give you the remaining time. Well, I mean, humans are in the loop one way or another, either um, the, the human user with the hands of the keyboard or the, um, um, or, or the designer of the system. Um, so uh, I, I wish more of my grad students had, had been like you, Congressman Massey. Um, so um, I, I use the ICS for decades. I was 25 years on the ambulance in my um, hometown in, in Vermont as a volunteer ambulance. And, and so cyber differs in, in, in this way. Um, so I need an organized structure to do my defense. But as an EMT, I'd walk into somebody's house and I was always reminiscent of the um, saying, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. I, I know how I'm gonna respond. The problem in cyber with having any static response or automated response to an attack is if I can figure out what your static response is gonna be, I own you because I can make you respond when I want you to respond and I know how you respond because too many of the cyber systems are not built in defensively to take into account that there's an intelligent actor causing the problem. Thank you. Too many of our systems by engineers of which I am one are designed to fail thinking nature is our enemy. And I understand stochastically what's gonna happen but I'm not building a system to protect other people. Thank, Thank you. you, yield back. Thank you. Next up will be Congress Member Johnson of Texas. Thank you very much. Uh, let me express my appreciation uh, for this hearing and the urgency of dealing with uh, the issue. Uh, five years ago in my Dallas-based congressional district, cyber hackers breached the Dallas area rapid transit computer system targeting customer communication and business processing tools. Just last year, hackers stole Trinity Metro's data in Fort Worth, knocking out the Metro's phone lines and entire booking system. And although not specific to the transportation industry, electronic records were hacked at the Dallas Independent School District in September, allowing uh, the hackers to gain access to the names, addresses, telephone numbers, social security numbers, and medical information. While just last month, the Dallas-based company of Neiman Marcus uh, notified 4.6 million customers 
that information associated with their online accounts had been stolen. Disheartening stories like this play out week after week uh, in the United States and across the globe. So first I wanna ask Mr. Belcher. Mr. Belcher, much of the nation's infrastructure is owned and operated by private sector. What controls and procedures do you recommend synthesizing and strengthening regarding cybersecurity in the private sector and the government partnership? Well, the, the good news is, um, you know, many of the, the, the hacks that you talked about in, um, in, the, in the public sector, in, your, uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, um, are actually being, have been moved to private sector vendors. Um, transit agencies now, for the most part, do not handle um, the records of private vendor, of private, um, private riders, the financial records. Those are typically handled by financial institutions now because those financial institutions are far better able and capable to handle those records under what under what's called under um, under a, a specific re regime that's been established, and um, and they're able to pr protect those records far better than um, than public transit agencies are. And really, at this point, only the largest public transit agencies do do it on their own um, because of that. And um, so I think we're I think we're 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 we've gotten a lot smarter. And I think in the public transit arena. Um, public transit agencies are, are, are continuing to try to push off as much as they can into the private sector, which itself is becoming much more sophisticated than the public agencies are. How do we transition to all inclusive security monitoring and tracking of information technology and operational technology systems to protect against these cyber attacks and breaches? and the alertness to enact immediate incidents response? Well, you're never gonna be able to, um, to track everything. I mean, and that's, you know, that's the challenge. You're, 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 never, you're, you're never gonna be, you, you have to try to stay ahead and you, know, you have to be able to be responsive, um, but you're never going to be able to, to, um, to be able to catch everything. We now have, um, we now have systems that you can that you can employ at the various levels of your uh, of your stack that can track what's going on and that can identify um, breaches. And every major system, whether it's an OT, uh, an operational technology system or an or an IT system, an information technology system, do have those systems in place. And again, that um, so we are we we pick up the vast majority of the hacks that occur. It's the ones that that slip through are the ones that we read about. So we are getting better at, at discovering and, and at, 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 at preventing them from occurring. And we have to continue to continue to up our game and continue to get better. I think what we're seeing though, and, and I think what, you, what you've highlighted is that um, especially in the public sector, we're, we're just not very sophisticated and we're under-resourced. And we, we need all the help we can get. And so we need to work with Congress, with the federal government, and with the private sector to rate to elevate every elevate the game at all levels. Because if we don't work together, we're going to continue to see the kinds of breaches that you that you've talked about. You touched on my last question. What amount of funding? Well, I think we're out of time, Congress member. Provide to assist individual transit agencies like the Dallas or Rapid Transit uh, with increasing. Uh, their cybersecurity um, programs. Maybe we can get that answer in writing. Uh, we're out of time, Congressmember Johnson. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Feel much. Back. Next up will be Congressmember Balderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being on today. Uh, my first question is directed to Mr. Farmer. Mr. Farmer, you noted in your testimony that the rail industry security plan does not just sit on its shelf occasionally taken down and dusted off. Rather, it is a living document elevated and enhanced continuously. It's great to hear how importantly the rail industry takes cybersecurity. It's also become obvious over the last several months just how delicate our supply chain is. 
Mr. Farmer, can you discuss the impact that a breach or a hack on just one class one railroad could have on our supply chain? And then a follow up to that would be what ripple effects would we see if a class one railroad had to shut down operations, even if just for a few days? So the question posits that the impact is one for which the response capability would not be adequate to sustain operations. I think the key point to make there is the entire basis of our cybersecurity program is to ensure the protection of the operations from breaches, uh, to contain any breaches that occur so that we are not facing a situation where the entire railroad network has to be shut down. And the key point here that, that came up in an exercise we held at the Naval War College, the, the Naval War College invited representatives of numerous critical infrastructure sectors uh, to an exercise in July, 2016. And it focused on operating a debilitated cyber environment and with participation by one of our major freight railroads. And a key point made by its chief information officer was, so long as I can communicate, I can continue to move trains. I think for us, we have the ability to fall back onto manual operations if necessary, uh, backup systems. So the whole purpose of the whole thrust of what we're doing is to ensure we don't find ourselves in a situation where that sort of shutdown happens by keeping in the layer defenses and the depths of operational capabilities, even down to manual and, and continue to move trains as safe conditions allow. Thank you. Uh, follow up to that, Mr. Farmer, um, you recommended future cybersecurity legislation should direct the CISA uh, to establish consistent standards for software bills of materials from vendors and suppliers. Can you expand on why this is important in preventing cyber attacks? Yes, sir. So a common theme, a recurring theme in, in the high profile attacks that have garnered such attention, particularly in the first uh, portion of this year for several months uh, was the supply chain vulnerability type attack. Again, that's where an adversary has identified a what's called a zero day vulnerability and exploits it. And so some of the major attacks that have been perpetrated with alleged involvement by nation state actors have followed this model. Solar winds is one example. The software bill of materials gives the end user an ability to understand fully what software applications and what versions are on any of the vehicles, equipment, devices, systems they employ. CISA strongly recommends that end users have these bills and materials. The challenge is there's no consistency in their being provided. And when they're provided, there's no consistency to ensure they're fully thorough and accurate. And there's an opportunity here for CISA to define standards so that end users can quickly act upon reported vulnerabilities, scan their networks using these software bills and materials as a reference point, and make any security patches to preclude the potential for exploitation. Thank you very much, great answer. Uh, my next question is for Mr. Stevens. Mr. Stevens, uh, thank you for being here today. I understand the Tampa International Airport is designated as a large hub, but can you speak on the differences between the threats or vulnerabilities faced at large hubs and the cybersecurity issues facing small or medium hubs? Congressman, thank you for that question. The threats are at their very basic nature, the same, the impacts are different. So when you're talking about large hub airports, um, particularly airports where there are a lot of connections, we're more of an O and B, so we don't do a lot of connecting activity, but the Dallas uh, Fort Worth airports, um, Los Angeles, all those types of airports have a different threat profile because attacking them becomes a much more um, preferred target if you're trying to create injury, if you're trying to create disruption. Smaller airport systems here in Florida, like say Gainesville or some of the other smaller airport systems, you know, the primary driving factor or interest there would may perhaps be data or information from employees or other vendors. So those are the major distinctions. It's the desirability from a bad actor of the target based on the scope and the size and the damage that they want to do. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my remaining, well, my mother's time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Next up will be Congress member Johnson of Georgia. Congress, Congress member, I think you're muted right now.
Congressmember Johnson of Georgia. Congressmember, I think you're muted right now. Can you unmute? All right, I'll, we'll come back to Congressmember Johnson. Next up will be Congressmember Auchinloss. Congressman Malinowski. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to go. Thank you very much, thank Congressman John. Johnson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and thank you to the witnesses for your time and testimony. The information age has radically changed our critical infrastructure landscape. Earlier this year, cyber attacks on solar winds and colonial pipeline demonstrated the emerging threat of cyber where cyber warfare from state and non-state actors. However, the cybersecurity field is beset by a dire shortage of specialists, especially among Americans of color and women. We as a Congress must act now to provide young Americans equitable access to cybersecurity training. The future of our national security depends on it. Mr. Belcher, this fall, I introduced H.R. 5593, the Cybersecurity Opportunity Act with Senator Ossoff, a bill which aims to create a pipeline of diverse cybersecurity workers by investing in research and training at historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions. You've served as the CEO of the Telecommunications Industry Association and president and the CEO of the Intelligent Transportation Society of, of America. So I assume you've encountered issues regarding cybersecurity, workforce shortages, and diversity. A 2021 study estimates that the national cybersecurity workforce is made up of 14% women, 9% Black Americans, and 4% Latino Americans. Can you discuss the importance of diversity goals as they apply to cybersecurity related positions in transportation and other critical infrastructure? Um, yes, I, I mean, I think you, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a much bigger issue than just cybersecurity. It's, a, it's an issue that's, um, that is, um, that is playing out in all of transportation and all of engineering. Um, Sean Wilson, the uh, Secretary of Transportation from Louisiana, who's now the new AASHTO chair, has made that one of his preeminent goals. He's also the uh, incoming vice chair of TRB. And so you have, there are leaders in, um, in the transportation community who have made that a significant priority. Um, the interesting thing about, um, I mean, I, I, I think the, the one, the only thing that I can add is, is it has finding women and people of color for um, technology positions has been a significant issue um, in the industry for, for, in, for a long time. Uh, it's becoming harder, but it's, it's becoming even harder because it's becoming difficult to find uh, people in general for these positions. And so what we're seeing now is um, I'm seeing my clients um, contracting those positions out um, where they would normally have hired in-house. They're now no longer able to find higher in-house positions. So transit organizations, transportation organizations now are going to contractors and filling the positions with contractors. And it, and it becomes even harder than to fill, to, to, to put, to fill those positions, to try to, to fill them with STEM type, um, type individuals. It, it, it's become even more challenging, not less challenging. So I, 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 I applaud you for, I applaud you for, um, for your, your, your legislation. Well, thank you. And we hope it'll make a difference. Uh, Dr. Kessler, you've had, You've had uh, extensive academic experience. 
teaching uh, computer technology education at some of the top engineering programs in America. Can you address how a more diverse cybersecurity workforce would benefit your specific infrastructure sector and what steps you might advise private industry in your sector to consider to improve diversity in regard to cybersecurity positions? Well, I, I have a couple of comments. Um, first of all, um, I, I, I too uh, applaud your legislation. I would observe that one of the problems um, keeping an appropriate number of all of our citizenry, but particular people of color and women is not at the college level, it's at the K through 12 level. I believe that too many individuals, and again, particularly women and particularly people of color are socialized out of STEM by sixth grade. So it's, it's laudable, but late in 12th grade to say you should go study STEM at college because they haven't been prepared. I have found um, that diversity of background gives me diversity of thought. And that's what I need to build a cyber defense because to build a cyber defense, I need to think like my attacker. The same thought um, leadership, if you will, that got me my problems are not gonna get me my solutions. So I need to have that diversity of thought. So um, I, I, is that addressing, I think, what you're asking? Uh, yes, it does. And I thank you for your, um, your comments. Um, Mr. Belcher, according to the 2020 MTI report presented in your testimony, 81% of responding transit agencies felt they were prepared to manage and defend themselves against cybersecurity threats. However, only 60% had an actual preparedness program, while 47% failed to audit their cybersecurity program at least once a year. What requirements should the federal government enforce so that cybersecurity safety is adhered to at these transit agencies? Well, if, um, if you look at the conclusions in the, um, of the study, um, I think that this, the conclusions kind of lay them out. I think there are some basic, some basic um, requirements. I, I think that, um, that agencies should be required to have a cybersecurity response plan in place. Thank you. I believe my time has expired and uh, I yield back. Next up will be Congressmember Stauber. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. You know, cyber uh, attacks are a serious and evolving risk that affect transportation and infrastructure matters across uh, this committee's jurisdiction. Uh, transportation and infrastructure jurisdiction includes five of the 16 sectors of cybersecurity cyber concerning, which include our transportation systems, government facilities, water and wastewater systems, dams, and emergency services. The nation's critical infrastructure is comprised of both public and private sector assets. However, within this committee's jurisdiction, cybersecurity requirements in the private sector are mainly voluntary. Like other industries and the federal government, the transportation sector is facing a critical shortage of cybersecurity personnel, which has impacted the ability to protect, detect, and respond to cyber attacks effectively. Simple steps regarding basic training, consistent cybersecurity hygiene, and periodic exercises could go a long way in protecting America's transportation infrastructure. As the technology that enables America's infrastructure becomes even more complex, and increasingly integrated, cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities will continue to multiply. My question is for Mr. Farmer. Mr. Farmer, we have heard from several industries expressing concern over potentially duplicative and conflicting cyber reporting requirements to various government agencies. Is this a concern for railroads? And if so, what steps could Congress consider to better harmonize such reporting across the government? So that's an excellent question. And it gets into two applications. One is what's being imposed by requirements and then what's being done under cooperative efforts initiated by industries with partners in government. Uh, for requirements, 
you know, a railroad with a cyber security incident could find itself having to meet a TSA regulation from 2009 under the Rail Transportation Security Rule that requires reporting of significant security concerns, uh, requirements to report to the Department of Transportation. Uh, if the transport involves a DOD supplies, requirements to support the DOD components. Uh, and then with these planned security directives, uh, a separate reporting requirement to the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, the concern there obviously is multiple reports on the same matter going to different organizations and the confusion that can result. Another key concern in this area, as has been noted previously, is the short timeline uh, envisioned by uh, both of the TSA the current regulation and the pending security directive, and that's a 24 hour period. And as has been detailed, it is often very difficult in that short time window to complete the analysis that helps an organization understand whether they're dealing with a significant cybersecurity concern. So we have, you know, our view is this area can be readily addressed through a collaborative process based on what we've heard a lot about today in terms of the reporting that's already taking place uh, by our industry, in the water sector, the transit sector, oil and natural gas sector. All of these industries have created information sharing analysis centers, or in our case, the Railroad Alert Network. And the focus is on taking what we are experiencing, what we are seeing, conducting analysis, and getting reports that, again, using the standard that Jen Easterly has said as Director of Cybersecurity and Security Agency, provides the government with signals, not noise, to aid their analytical efforts. And I think if there's an area where Congress's action is, is vitally important, it comes in down to two points. One, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015 should be fully implemented, and it's not. That will create the conditions. It specifically authorizes the kind of information sharing we've been talking about within sectors, across industries, between industry and government. It also provides protections that remove impediments to timely flow of useful information. And the second element is we've got to close a gap on analysis. A lot of reporting goes into government, but it doesn't often come back in terms of the sort of cybersecurity information products transportation organizations need. It has to be focused on transportation. What does this activity mean to transportation organizations? What should they do about it in terms of some of the measures you laid out on cybersecurity actions to narrow their risk profile? Thank you. Uh, well stated, that was a very defined answer. Um, and uh, my time is running short here. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Next up will be Congress Member Malinowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to uh, address some questions to uh, to Mr. Sullivan, um, uh, and because I'm in particular very concerned about the water sector's vulnerability to to cyber attacks. Uh, most of us here are familiar with what happened in Oldsmar, Florida. I think other members. Uh, uh, raised that case when an intruder took control of an engineer's screen at a water plant and dialed up the, the levels of sodium hydroxide. And thankfully, it was noticed a disaster was averted. But um, as former uh, CISA director Chris Krebs has noted, um, after the attack, uh, that the, the vulnerabilities in the Oldsmar plant, as he said, are probably more the rule than the exception. Um, there are a lot of things that need fixing here, um, and we've heard a, about a number of them throughout the hearing today. Municipalities need more funding, more in-house technical expertise, better cyber hygiene practices, um, and more, and the federal government can, can and should help with these things. Um, but it's also my view, at least, that the federal government should also have a bit more visibility into these breaches when they're discovered, that we shouldn't be relying um, as we do today on voluntary reporting. So Mr. Sullivan, you, um, you noted in your testimony that your organization, Water uh, ISAC, uh, created a step-by-step 15-point -step document to help uh, water and wastewater utilities with cybersecurity challenges. We took a look at that document, and there's some very useful, actionable information in there. I'm grateful to the help you're providing to utilities, but the language on reporting of incidents particularly caught my, uh, my eye. In the document, um, you urge utilities and other sector stakeholders to report incidents and suspicious activity to your analysts at 
Water Isaac. And you further note that as a private nonprofit, Water Isaac is not subject to public records law, further preserving the security of your report. Again, sort of emphasizing the privacy of this information. Um, so I wanted to ask your views, and I think chairman, uh, the chairman of the committee uh, asked a number of, uh, of others on the panel this question before. What are your views on creating mandatory reporting requirements for municipalities for certain types of cyber incidents? Well, uh, mandatory can work. First of all, what we have seen is it's, it was way too short a time. Uh, we, we struggled and we're, we're pretty good at our IT. Uh, we struggled over the first 24 hours to find out what we were dealing with. Um, so if we do go to mandatory, we've got to go 72 hours and maybe not the full report in 72, but reporting in 72 and then being able to follow up a couple of weeks later because it took us three weeks to figure out exactly what happened. Right. Um, as, as far as the, the mandatory, we then have to explain to everyone what is an incident. And as I described earlier, we have so many water systems that uh, although they have cybersecurity um, uh, protocols, et cetera, I'm not sure everyone understands an incident. So we have to be very careful. We can definitely work, the water sector would definitely work with Congress to help identify what triggers um, an incident. Else, every time something goes wrong, we're just gonna be flooding a market under the mandatory because we are so used to standards in the water and wastewater. You'll get a lot of information, much of which may be useless. So we need to be very careful what we, what we call mandatory. But that's the only way we're gonna get it. Water ISAC struggles to get people to report to us what is going on out there so that we can share that information and others can learn from it. We, we constantly ask our members, what went on, what happened, so that we can take that information, take your name out of it, we'll call it a, a, a utility in the Northeast, we'll call it a utility in America. And to share the information so we can all learn. It's the only way we're gonna figure out what's happening in our sector. Got it. Makes, makes sense. And I, I, I mean, it would, it's fair to assume that there probably have been um, other Oldsmar-like intrusions that we just don't know about, right? Because we don't have mandatory reporting. Uh, I, would, I would say there were definitely was other problems that had occurred that weren't reported because they really didn't need to be or they didn't realize they were a cyber intrusion. Good. Thank you so, so much. Look forward to working with you on this. And I yield back my time. The gentleman yields. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Puerto Rico, Ms. Gonzalez Colon. Ms. Gonzalez Colon. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Uh, time sufficient to Thomas Massey. I thank the gentleman from Tennessee for yielding me more than zero seconds this time. Uh, Mr. Farmer, you spoke about something, uh, a best practice, well, it should be a best practice, but I think it's underutilized and underappreciated that you learned from consulting with the War College about operating in a degraded or debilitated digital communications environment. Uh, it's, it's my hope, that, you know, and you mentioned that you looked at how you could go to manual systems and uh, in those times. Also, I think a, a lot of people need to be doing that as a best practice at, the, at water plants or at pipelines or at, uh, sewer plants. I think that's something that they should follow and, and look to and even look at possible parallel analog systems. It's, it's very hard to hack an analog system but everything has gone to digital now. And um, could you just tell us a little bit more about uh, that part of your process or what you learned from the War College? The War College exercise sort of brought together representatives of numerous critical infrastructure sectors, including some represented in the work of the committee in this hearing. Uh, it was an initiative where the military wanted to do a, a focused exercise on a scenario involving a activity by China that necessitated naval deployment and looking at logistically what would it take to get all the resources to deploy a naval task force and how would that work in a debilitated cyber environment. And a key question that came up over and over again 
is well, just how much operations could be retained if the information technology systems were not as available as we are used to them being prevalent. And for the rail industry, there were repeated points made along the lines I referenced earlier. Essentially, as long as communication can be made in some way to get the train crews engaged, to get the trains organized, particularly for the military deployments is that priority, we could continue to operate. It would not be as efficient as normal, but we could continue to get trains to destination and with the priority of the military shipments, get the items from forts to ports for deployment. Beyond that exercise, we had a, during the 2017, 2018 period, we participated with uh, Transportation Command and Northern Command in a forts to ports analysis where they were looking at how we, how the military deploys from its installations to ports at coastal areas and what are the logistics there. And that work involved a great deal of sharing of information by our industry on both our physical security planning and preparedness and response measures and on the cyber side as well. And so a very good partnership with military components in terms of ensuring we're able to support their operations in situations where they need to get equipment uh, and people, uh, sorry, mostly equipment, uh, to ports for transport overseas. Well, I surely hope that any legislation that comes out of Congress doesn't force you into a, a, a system that assumes that you will always be operating in uh, an, a secure cyber environment. Uh, and so I'm glad to hear that you've at least tested what would happen in, in that instance. And you're going to look like a prophet later uh, if they go back and look at this hearing, if they have somehow forced you into a completely digital solution that's not segmented. That was another thing that you mentioned that I think is a really smart thing that you that uh, one hack on your system wouldn't imply the whole system was hacked. I think that's uh, also a good best practice that I hope will come out of this. Um, you know, part of the problem we have, and this is ironic, is our federal procurement standards sort of bake in vulnerabilities. You, I don't know exactly what's available in the executive branch, but in the legislative branch, if you wanted to buy a zero trust system that ran on Linux, you couldn't do it because there's interoperability requirements with uh, Microsoft systems, which have... Uh, by the way, a lot of these uh, commercially available, widely deployed systems have the requirement that the end user is not at the root level. The end user is not the root user. The actual root user is the vendor. And, they may, and they've convinced the end user that it's in their best interest to let them send real-time updates. We can make you more secure if we can identify a threat somewhere else and then update your system without you hitting yes or no on the screen. Just let us go ahead at the root level and update your system and we can make you safer if you allow us to do that. Well, that's not always the case. And that's the vulnerability that oftentimes uh, makes a small exploit turn into a giant one. So uh, Mr. Kessler, I think you're wise to uh, encourage and solicit diversity of solutions from your students. And I wish we had more diversity of solutions allowed in the procurement of policies. And I yield back. Mr. Chairman, that um, my intellect is so much superior to um, Thomas Massey's. That's why I had him deliver those questions so that the average citizen could understand them. And I yield back the remainder of my time. And the gentleman yields. Chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, I want to continue to pull on the threat of water infrastructure. Uh, we know that our water infrastructure in the country needs serious improvement in Massachusetts alone. Uh, we've got between 10 to $15 billion of a maintenance backlog for water potability and riverine and littoral resilience. Uh, I submitted four projects to the House Appropriations Committee requesting funding for critical water projects in Massachusetts and Unlike Boston, which has the scale and the scope to have a, a sophisticated IT component to its water and sewer public works, uh, these towns are small and they don't necessarily have those kinds of resources and, and have the ability to have that type of expertise on, on standby. Uh, so in addition to making investments in water potability itself, we need to be making investments in securing that critical infrastructure from, from cyber attacks. Mr. Sullivan, um, the Boston Water and Sewer Commission, where you're the chief engineer, as you said, has suffered from a ransomware attack last year. And in your testimony, you noted that because the business network was segregated from the control system, 
there was never any threat to public or environmental health. And just to give you a sense of the, of the divergence um, in terms of Boston's scale and some of the towns in my district, Norton, which is uh, a town that, that recently uh, launched a new $11 million uh, water treatment plant in February 2020 that's been exceptionally effective, that has a base of, of about 20,000 residents. Boston has a base of about 675,000 residents, so two orders of magnitude here almost. Um, has the Boston Water and Sewer Commission been able to communicate with these smaller Massachusetts entities about best practices? Uh, should they be attacked? Or even been able to form a, a collaborative regional uh, working group so that there is some sort of umbrella protection from the bigger cities? Well, we, we work with all the Massachusetts uh, through the mass warn system should something come up. But we recommend to them that they actually join the Water Ice Act because you get national exposure. Uh, it's difficult sometimes when an entity as large as ours is talking and we talk about, well, you should buy this, buy that, and the smaller towns go, how are we going to afford it and who's going to run it? So it's better that they go to a national one who has like size utilities um, where they, we can put them in touch with them and they can communicate on the same level how they took care of it because we do operate in different levels of scope. Um, you know, the, the treatment systems are all the same. It's the size of the system. And whether it's fully automated or whether you have a 24 seven operator watching the screen as Oldsmar did. Uh, they happen to be lucky they watched the screen and it was moving because someone got in on their system. The other problem we have with some of the smaller systems is they, they want to tie into the internet so they can use things like TeamViewer, which was at Oldsmar, so that they can operate these remotely. Uh, during COVID was one of the biggest things. How can I run my automated plant remotely? So we've got to get away from that. We've got to get them down to a much secure system that, that is run uh, where the OT is totally separate from the IT. And, and we, we do talk to the different communities and we're always open. But again, we try to refer them to someone of like size who has had the same problems. So if I could recapitulate what you're saying here, it's it, you would encourage them to join uh, Water Isaac, you would encourage them to separate or to not permit of remote operation uh, to require on-site operation. Uh, any further recommendations that you would give to uh, smaller towns, IT departments in particular? Well, one of the other problems is in small towns, the IT department may reside in at the town hall and not necessarily with the water or wastewater department. And so they communicate occasionally, but they don't really live the IT issues. And that we see in many of the small towns. Uh, it's part of city government, town government. Um, and I'm, I'm not aware exactly how the Norton system set up. If there's even an IT expert working for the water department, many times it's uh, someone released to them from the town. So I would need to look into it. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, I appreciate the answers and, and the work that you're doing to ensure uh, the resilience of our water infrastructure in Massachusetts. Chair yields the balance of his time. And the chair recognizes uh, the gentlelady from Puerto Rico, Ms. Gonzalez Colon. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Guest. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to our panel, uh, Congress has taxed uh, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure uh, Security Agency, as the lead agency in both protecting our cyber and defending against any cyber threats and cyber attacks. Uh, I would like you, if the panel would, to, to please provide any information, any insight with your interaction with CISA, the benefits that they have provided and any shortcomings uh, that you see that, that may exist uh, between the in CISA's interaction uh, and the interaction with your industry uh, or your particular company. Well, since nobody else is jumping in, I'll jump in. Um, the the interactions that I've had with CISA actually have been primarily through Coast Guard colleagues who are doing tours at CISA. Um, I think CISA has um, started to take a lead role um, with Coast Guard in some of the protections and ports. I think they've done a really good job at trying to get the word out and, and, and take that role. Um, 
I have also some colleagues in the energy field who are doing some work with CISA. And I mean, my the, the, the work that I've seen from CISA and the output from the agency seems to be um, appropriate. And, you know, there's always more that we can do. I think that's one of the recurring themes here. But um, I, I, I think they've done an excellent job and I don't really have anything I would point to right now and say that they're, they're deficient. This is Megan Sanford. I'm happy to comment on that as well. Uh, I, I applaud Department of Homeland Security and CISA actually. I think that they have a tremendous mission. I think that their scope is uh, one of the largest that the federal government has. Uh, it's been my experience that, especially when dealing with vulnerability handling and coordination, uh, the entity, I think the name has changed now, but it used to be known as ICS CERT uh, out in Idaho. Despite any company I've worked with uh, over the past decade, I, I've been able to, to call that team and we've been able to work through issues. Um, they've always been at the ready. Uh, Mark Bristow, who currently leads their hunting team there, he, he's also an advocate. He's one of the other four people that are currently credentialed as an incident commander for cyber under the FEMA system. Uh, they believe the construct can work. Um, they, they do a really good job at templating uh, exercise material response plans. In many cases, I think that these materials are underutilized or the private sector simply isn't educated on. If the private sector were more educated on the resources available through CISA, I, I think that we would see um, greater utilization of that agency, but I, I, I hold them in very high regard. Uh, can agencies improve? Uh, yes, of course, but uh, my interactions with that entity have been very good. And Ms. Amber, let me follow up on that just a little bit. Uh, you talked a little bit about the, the raising awareness, the education of CISA. Uh, what can Congress do to make sure that we are educating our businesses, educating our, our key industries uh, on first the existence of CISA? Because I think many people have never heard of CISA. If you're not in the homeland security realm, uh, CISA is just another acronym and you have no idea what it stands for. Uh, but with the recent cyber attacks that we've seen uh, and, and, and the threats of growing cyber attacks, whether that be uh, criminal elements, rogue nations who are using uh, uh, cyber attacks to either espionage, ransomware. Uh, what can we as Congress do to better educate? Because what we want people to do is we want them to be aware of CISA, what the, the benefits that CISA has to offer. When there is an attack, we would like for them then to report that to CISA so that we can investigate and try to go forward. And so do you have any thoughts on what we can do to, again, improve that, improve that awareness of this, uh, of this agency? Uh, sure, thank you, uh, thank you. And that's, that's a great question. I, I believe that any uh, public show of support for CISA and its efforts, I think that that is a, is a tremendous deal. I can tell you um, there was one program in particular that I think uh, CISA and Department of Homeland Security have been especially successful at since, it since the department was stood up and that's uh, the Protective Security Advisor Program. Uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, I was actually working in the governor's office of Tim Kaine at the time, but Virginia was the first state to have a pilot program for Protective Security Advisors and now Every state has at least one protective security advisor, but this individual, that's exactly what their job is, is they go out to the designated critical infrastructures and they do physical security site assessments. And now I understand that CISA has cyber uh, security advisors that accompany the protective security advisors. And so they're kind of two in a box visiting these infrastructures, wastewater treatment facilities, you name it. And they're talking about the different programs that CISA can offer to them. So I think any, uh, any public show of endorsement for these programs and CISA and the direct interaction with the private sector is, is definitely appreciated at all levels. The gentleman's time has expired. I'm over time, I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman yields. And that concludes our hearing. I would like to thank each of our witnesses for your testimony today. Your comments were informative and helpful. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.